Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the northeast corner of the most brilliant country in the world, that is sunny South Africa. And we sit here in the Kruger National Park, an iconic wilderness area of the world, proclaimed in 1926, just after the Union of South Africa. And since then, it has been welcoming tourists and forging ahead with African conservation forever. Hmm? We're all right, Brian. No, you're just burning out. I was burning out. I'm not burning out anymore. That is a camera term. Do not worry. I'm not, in fact, on fire. You are most welcome, especially Miss Mervine's class in Virginia Beach, Virginia. You are watching here from the Advanced Human Geography class. I don't know what that means, but I hope that you will ask me questions related to whatever Advanced Human Geography is, and I'll tell you as much as I can about Advanced Human Geography here in the wilderness of the Kruger National Park. My name is James Hendry. On camera today is Brian. That's Brian's thumb, everyone. And on the other vehicle there is uh, no one, because we are alone today. Uh, the other vehicle is down, broken, no longer. X, not going to be functioning this afternoon. So you will be staring at my ugly mug, re-watching Brian's brilliant camera work, and hopefully finding some animals so that you don't have to stare at my ugly mug for the entire three hours that are about to pass. Uh, Louise is on the final control directing seat, and Kirsten is on the keys. That's uh, called alliteration. I know that's for the English class that was yesterday. Advanced human geography doesn't worry about alliteration. Over there, Brian, we have some Nyala. And the Nyala are sexually dimorphic. So what that means is that the male is completely different. This is fascinating. I've never seen this before. Did you see that, Brian? We may have some mating here. That is unusual. Normally, they're very private about it. So that is a male nyala, and that's a female nyala. <laughs> Con <laughs> Connor, I'm going to ask you a question again. You want to know the local areas, the t settlements here are known as towns, villages, hamlets, clustered or dispersed. Um, Connor, it's been a while since I did advanced human geography, but out here we call them villages, and I suppose they would all be part of, you see, I mean, the terminology is slightly different out here, but they would be called villages, local villages, and they in turn would be part of a larger municipal area, which would in turn fall into a sort of region or a province. And the largest town closest to us is Hootspreit. Now, Hootspreit would be considered a town. It's probably got a population of an excess of, well, all in about 20,000 people. And each of the little villages out here probably has a population of about three or 4,000 and comprised of various households with between four and eight people in each. And as I said yesterday, they are largely from the Shangan or Shitsonga group and they're very poor rural villages, no municipal services in any of the villages, no running water. So everybody goes to fetch water from a communal village tap. There is some electricity, but it's very expensive and a lot of people can't afford to pay for it. Nothing in the way of um, tarred roads or asphalt roads, paved roads. They're all dirt roads, rutted, uh, fairly nastily sort of rutted roads. And what else do we have? There's no reticulated sewage, so all um, sort of human waste goes into outhouses or long drop toilets in each of the little stands that lives there. So that's a basic outline of what happens. And each of the little households has a little garden, or well, some of them do, and if they're very lucky, some will have boreholes. Now, Kelly, you ought to know what language is spoken. There are two main languages. The first and most commonly spoken language around here is the language of Shitsonga or Shangan. And it is a beautiful language and not a click language. I think, Kelly, that was the other part of your question. Is it a clicking language? No, it isn't. Uh, there are two or three, no, in fact, there are four clicking languages in South Africa. One of them is Siswati, the other is Ndebele, and then we have Isizulu and the most clicky of them all, I suppose, would be Isikosa. So you can all try and say that in Mrs. Mervine's advanced human geography class, Isikosa, Isikosa, and that would be spelled I-S-I-X-H-O-S-A, I-S-I-X-H-O-S-A. And so Shangan is not a clicky language at all. It is actually quite a whistly language. They say things like, 
shihari. So one animal would be shihari, many animals would be shihari. And if you wanted to say the animals were running, shihari, shi, tsutsuma. And if you wanted to say the animals are running to eat grass, then you would say shihari, shi tsutsuma, gojabzani. So it's a quite an interesting language. Now we're going to move from here. And I will keep talking about this now. Kayla, you are an astute student, clearly, in Mrs. Mervine's advanced human geography class. And you want to know about, sorry, Taylor, not Kayla, T for Taylor, as in Swift or the magnificent American guitar. Um, Taylor, you want to know about, are the people out here subsistence farmers? They are largely subsistence farmers. Some have jobs, but there is an unemployment rate of probably between 60 and 70 percent in some of the villages out here. So in order to survive, people must engage in subsistence farming. And that subsistence farming would take the form of maize growing in the summer when there's rain. And they would grow in communal fields, they will grow maize. And then in the winter time, when the sun's not so hot, uh, they will grow vegetables in the stands at home. So you have a kind of home garden where they grow things like uh, onions, spinach, tomatoes, lettuce, ground nuts sometimes, and sometimes pumpkins. Those are the major little sort of garden crops that they would grow. And then, of course, there is cattle. And a huge tradition of African people, all the way from sub-Saharan African people, is the keeping of cattle. And cattle, of course, are extremely important in terms of an investment for wealth. And wealth is often measured still to this day in the number of cattle that a person has. There are some guinea fowl which actually do make relatively good eating if you know how to cook them. If you don't, you may as well eat a stone. Hello, Victor. You're interested in whether the animals are distressed at the noises we make or if they are used to us. Well, Victor, I think, I mean, you kind of watching the screen there should answer that question for you. So you saw these guinea fowls moving to a distance away from us. It wouldn't be so much the noise as our presence. Uh, noise is combined with that, of course, and now they feel that they're within the flight or fight dis distance, and they, they are without the flight outside of the flight distance, so they don't need to run away from where they are now. Same thing with those Nyala. When we first saw them, it was just before you joined us, and there was a female a bit closer than where that male and female were. She moved it to a distance that she felt was safe, and that's how they lived. So yes, we do affect the animals when we drive past. It is not probably as noisy as you think it is where you are. Um, this vehicle will reverberate noise, and there's noise coming in through the microphone at the top of the camera there. Um, I've got a lapel mic, which should be picking up my voice. Um, but it will, because of the reverberation, it will sound probably a bit noisier than it actually is. It's quite a, it's quite a um, quiet car. It's a little straight six engine, so some of you will know what that means. Um, it is quite an old engine, though. This is quite a wide-ranging question, and um, if I don't get, answer it correctly, then please feel, sorry, Jonah, <laughs> not Fiona, Jonah. <laughs> uh, I'm not hearing Louise quite well today. Uh, she, said, she said, not Fiona, Jonah, like the dude who got swallowed by the giant fish. Thank you for that, Louise. No need to get shirty. Now, uh, Jonah, you want to know about the geography of this area and the region. It's quite a wide-ranging question, so if I don't give you what you want to hear, please feel free to send through another. And uh, this time I won't call you Fiona, which, of course, uh, is inescapably not your name. Um, Jonah, the general region is called Mpumalanga, the particular area that we're in. That's the province that we're in. And it consists of the Highfelt regions off to the western side there. Highfelt means highlands, so it goes up the Jarkensburg escarpment onto the highlands. 
and there's quite a lot of coal mining and that sort of stuff there. The two big towns there would be called Emma Lashleni. That's Emma Lashleni. I'm not going to spell it to you unless you ask me to. And Middleburg, there are two very major uh, sort of coal mining centers. And then if you come further east towards the Drakensberg Mountains, which we can't see at the moment, you go down into the low felt areas. And we're only about, what, 1,300 feet above sea level here, so much lower down. Some of those areas up at the top there are ooh, almost 8,000 feet above sea level. So it's a substantial drop. And as you come down into this area, it's much smaller towns and settlements. The capital of the province is a place called Nelspruit, and that's a fairly major urban area with um, pretty much first world services. Um, you know, it's all paved. There are malls. I mean, you would you would get on very well there. You'd, you'd be able to operate in a settlement like that. And if you head north towards where we are now, you go through. You start going through rural villages like I was describing, and uh, that's where you would, I suppose, if you came here as a complete foreigner and somebody dropped you there, uh, you'd struggle a little bit because you wouldn't really understand how the systems work but there's very little in the way of paved roads no municipal services and that sort of thing and so that's the sort of settlements down in the low felt here and then as you come further east we come into this game reserve area and that's the Kruger National Park which extends all the way to the Mozambican border that is a very rough overview of what this province looks like. To the north of us, and also the Kruger Park, is Limpopo province, and also very similar. The mountains sort of cut, cut them off halfway along, and it's low down, sort of 1,300 feet above sea level over here, um, between, say, what should we say, between about 3,000 and 8,000 feet from the mountains upwards into the high felt. Does that give you an answer, Jonah? If it doesn't, please feel free to ask again. Hello, Lucas. You were asking about the area of the Kruger National Park. And, uh, ooh, quite a nice suggestion here. I will do that. Um, I'm going to draw you a map, but first I'm going to just get to some water because uh, there's some elephant tracks here going towards the water, so it might be quite nice. Um, Lucas, you want to know how big the Kruger National Park is? You're t you're, you've used the term, how many miles is it? Um, well, miles, of course, is a, is a distance rather than an area. The Kruger National Park takes up... 2.2 million hectares. Now, a hectare is the metric system that we use out here for um, for measuring area. And in acres, you can multiply that by 2.4, and you'll get to roughly 5 million acres. So the Kruger National Park is roughly 5 million acres, which turns out to be 22,000 square kilometers. And and my mental arithmetic will not extend to giving that to you in um, square miles, but you can work it out. Take 22,000 multiplied by 1.6 and you will get to the number of square miles that the Kruger National Park takes up. It of course extends also across the border. It's called a transfrontier park. It extends into the border, across the border into Mozambique to the east and Zimbabwe to the north. Eight million acres of contiguous wildlife area so much larger than anything I think in the in the lower states of the United States Alaska's got some bigger ones but bigger than anything here, here. Alec you want to know we've uh, experienced any droughts any environmental troubles like droughts Alex we're in the middle of a drought now Alex and although it doesn't look particularly dry in this area we had 20 millimeters of rain or about an inch of rain the other day we're in the middle of the worst drought since 1904 now that of course was before even I was born it was before even Miss Mervine was born and indeed before anybody uh, currently living was born uh, we think and so it's an extremely long time since we had a summer this hot or a summer this dry. And in fact, worldwide, of course, we know that this has been the hottest year in human history since records were kept and possibly even since the, before then. And 
and that has taken its toll here. We're having immense drought. That means the animals are starting to suffer. They weren't at the initially, and now as we go sort of towards the dry season, without having had the wet season proper, so the animals are starting to suffer a little bit now. Good one, Alex. Thank you very much. Other environmental issues around here? Not many. I mean, there are a number of human-induced ones, but nothing that's that major. There's a water buck, Brian. You'll see it running through the bush. Hello, Mrs. Singer. While we are looking at those water buck, is that all right? Well, let me go forward. There's some better ones here. Those are water buck, everyone. And it's a species of antelope. That's a little baby one. Uh, Mr. Singer, you want to know about uh, issues of poaching. Do we have poaching issues here? Yes, we do. And they can be just divided into two broad character, carry, um, categories. The first category would be poaching for the pot. So as we know, there is an enormous unemployment problem. And the unemployment problem means that there are hungry people about. And that means that people will come onto the reserve if they're feeling desperate. They will set snares and try and catch things like those water buck or like an impala or something like that and take the meat home to eat it. So whether you can call that poaching or desperation hunting, I don't know, that's up to you. Um, I would call it the latter, but certainly it is uh, an illegal form of hunting. Then you get the other category, which is the big game, commercial poaching. And, of course, we know that rhino are a major problem. I was just reading an article about uh, elephants at the moment. Uh, up to 50,000 elephants are being shot on this continent every year. Southern Africa at the moment has managed to stay relatively free of this problem, but we reckon the problem is coming here if we're not very careful. I'm just looking over here because there was some alarm calling from some birds which means they were thinking quite carefully about whether or not there's a predator around here. But I don't see anything. So we know that there's a lot of incursion for rhino poaching. And on this particular area, because we're on private land, um, you know, there's a lot more money to throw around in terms of protecting the rhino. And the problem seems to have almost abated on these private reserves. In the Kruger, it's still an issue. Remember, they share a border with Mozambique, which I think is almost 600 kilometers long. That is um, 600 kilometers is roughly, I don't know, about 400 miles long. And so if there are, if there are poachers desperate enough coming in from Mozambique, uh, then, you know, it can be a real problem. And they're the, they're the real issue. It's not a question, you know, the poaching for the pot is something we can deal with. But obviously we can't afford to lose any more rhino. Evan, you want to know about agriculture in this area? Evan, I'm no expert on agriculture, uh, and there's certainly no agriculture in this particular area, but uh, what I will tell you, I, don't, I can't give you figures on how many um, you know, farmers there are per hectare and that sort of thing. I can tell you that the area for agriculture in this low felt area, which means the low down areas, um, they grow veggies quite a lot, tomatoes, pumpkins, um, what do you call them, zucchinis, baby marrows, uh, what else would there be, butternuts, so all kind of gourd or pumpkin type uh, vegetables. And then there are citrus farms, large citrus farms, very large tomato farms, which cause an environmental nightmare. And a tomato farm is a, a really not a particularly healthy thing for the, for the earth. Um, and then we do, what else do we have, Brian, out here? We have mainly citrus and tomatoes and a couple of veggies. Then up on the high felt, you will find maize. Uh, you might find sunflowers and wheat as well. But otherwise, it's largely wildlife down here. Mm. 
Andrea, what a lovely question. You wanted to know if I've ever seen an animal out here with a noticeable genetic mutation. Um, I suppose I have, Andrea. I suppose something like a, uh, a white lion, for example, a lion which uh, carries the gene for leukism, which uh, is a mutation of sorts. Uh, it's not a particularly successful one because obviously a white lion is more obvious than a tawny one out here. We've, so we see those from time to time. We do see sometimes uh, female antelope like impala or kudu that have scraggly horns, which they shouldn't have horns at all normally. So that would have been a genetic mutation probably that coded for an extra amount of testosterone, which in turn um, created the horns. Uh, I'm just trying to think of anything obvious, any other things. I mean, I suppose you do get the odd thing like a two-headed snake, for example, which would be born, but then it would die almost immediately. So very little. And as it is born in tip-top condition out here, it will die almost immediately. It'll either be eaten by predators or it'll be abandoned by the herd. Great example of an elephant a number of years back, which had a kind of, um, her, her knees bent the wrong way at the back. And for three years, the herd tried to keep her up with, the, with it and eventually they abandoned her because she couldn't keep up anymore. And as soon as they abandoned her, she was killed by hyenas. So anything that has a noticeable mutation will normally die, and therefore that mutation, of course, will not survive in the population. Zachary, you want to know about religion in the region. Zachary, I suppose people would be called nominally, of the indigenous people here, they would be called nominally Christian. So if you said to somebody, or, you know, who do you believe in, they would say they believed in God and Jesus, and they have various sects of Christianity out here, the major one being something called the Zionist Christian Church, or ZCC, which is um, it's a very large uh, church in, in Southern Africa. And or some of the beliefs are that they have um, they they <laughs> they have an incredible meeting of millions of people at a place called Moria around Easter time. They don't drink any alcohol, um, and otherwise it's a fair, and they don't eat any pork. But otherwise it's, it's I suppose what you would call a Protestant Christian religion. And then there are others, the Seventh-day Adventists and various other Presbyterians are out here. Uh, the Anglicans are out here too. The most famous Anglican, of course, being Archbishop Desmond Tutu, a great son of our country. Um, and then, amongst the indigenous people, it is always kind of mixed in with a fascinating mix of what I suppose would have been a traditional religion of ancestor worship or certainly belief in a communing with the ancestors. So people will always take heed of what the ancestors say and um, if anything goes wrong in a village or in a family, there's always a suspicion that the family's been bewitched and often then that they will talk, they need to talk, as it could do through the Brian, that they need to commune or communicate with the ancestors in order to remove the curse that has been placed on the family. That's Kudu. That is the largest antelope that we get out here. So those are the major religions. Mrs. Mervine, um, <laughs> you want to know why tomato farming is bad for the land. Mrs. Mervine, tomato farming is bad for the land because what it does is it infects the soil with a particular virus. I think it's a virus. And if you grow tomatoes for more than th two or three years at a time in a particular piece of land, you then cannot grow anything else in that land for the next three or four or five years sometimes. Now also, so that's one of the reasons. The next reason is that you also have to suck an enormous amount of water. They take a lot of irrigation tomatoes. And there are giant rivers in the Limpopo and Mpumalanga provinces that are carrying far less water than they would normally because of the tomato farmers. And you combine that with the amount of fertilizer that goes onto the tomato farms and then washes down into those river systems, it can be tremendously environmentally detrimental. And I know there's an enormous tomato farming company up near Limpopo and Mpumalanga, and they keep moving further and further away from their packing depots because the land between them and the packing depots is unusable anymore. 
so it's not particularly almost like any monoculture any monoculture is going to have a problem ah. now we have had up to word of a breeding herd of buffalo to get back at a um, close to where we started we're going to drive back there hello jonah not fiona um where you want to know i've any been, ever been attacked by an animal um i've been warned and i've been i've been charged by one or two animals but jonah no i wouldn't uh, attack would it imply some kind of physical contact i've never had physical contact from a wild animal and just because i'm generally pretty careful out here it's not to say it couldn't happen one day by mistake but we definitely try and stay a certain distance from animals so that that doesn't actually occur I'm going to drive a bit quicker because I'm not sure how much time we have left with you and I'd like you to see at least a herd of buffalo. It is of course very hot at the moment and so the animals are kind of still sitting around in the shade. We've only got about 10 minutes left with you so I'm going to drive quite quickly. in Maryland you say you say you've seen a video where local people chased animals off a pride of lions at no chased a pride of lions off a kill and then went in and stole a piece of the kill and does this happen often out here no Robin I can tell you categorically it never happens out here uh, maybe once or twice but that I've, I've, I know that I think I've, I've seen the video that you've seen and Robin that was shot probably up in Kenya or Tanzania where the the um, where the boundaries of the parks are not so nearly clearly defined I mean then some of them are those big areas like the there's some warthogs well this is a very sad warthog this one we've seen her a few times she's very ill Let's see she's totally emaciated it's got a little baby and I think the drought combined with possibly a disease has made her very skinny and Taylor you are you are, like J Jonah want to know if I've been attacked by an animal um, while driving no I have had one or two elephants charge but normally we can get out of the way. I did have one incident where there was a leopard that was being attacked by wild dogs. And the leopard got a fright and jumped up onto the vehicle. And that was a very terrifying experience indeed. But as Louise says, the largest attackers of human beings while driving are flies. Brian, you would agree with that? I do agree. Yes, Brian gets attacked by flies a lot. He's attacked right now. He's being, <laughs> he's being savaged at the moment by a large number of flies. Now, this warthog, I believe, is not only suffering from drought. I think there is definitely a sickness or disease within her because none of the other warthogs look this bad. Some of them are getting a bit skinny, but she is just in a state. Now, one of the things that we don't do, of course, is interfere. So while she doesn't look great, she might survive. Uh, you know, a lot of the time animals recover from the most incredibly horrific looking things. Hello, Mia. You want to know how long and hot the average summer day is here? Well, Mia, in the middle of summer, the sun will come up at about, what, 10 to 5, Brian? Yeah. And then at, in the middle of summer, <laughs> look at that little thing. He's a bit nervous of us. He's in very fine health. Mia, and then the sun will go down again at about 7 o'clock in the middle of summer. And remember, then in the middle of winter, um, it doesn't change that much, not like where you are. So we'll have a mid-winter sunrise around quarter to 7 in the morning, and then the sun will set at sort of oh, just after 5 in the middle of winter. So it's not a huge difference. Two hours each way, maybe. Now, Delaney, you are 
you've asked a question that's quite interesting. You say, is it mating season and are there a lot of babies? Remember, mating season and lambing or birthing season are two totally distinct things. Mating season will vary. So for the impala, it will be in May. For the kudu and the water buckets around about now. And the lambing or calving season will normally be during the height of the rains or just after the first rains. So the birthing season for the impala is the end of November and beginning of December. The birthing season for kudu and waterbuck would be probably the end of February. And their mating season, of course, will be, well, we're going into it now. So the mating season is when they mate, and then the calving season, when you'll see lots of babies, is kind of during the height of the first rain. So we are seeing some little kudu and nyala, at least kudu and waterbuck. Uh, the nyala have pretty much all given birth. All of the impala have given birth. And you can see the warthogs, that little pig there is probably about a month and a half old. So they would have given birth, well, maybe even two months, just around the end of December. Now, Courtney, you want to know about natural disasters in this area. I think let's leave this emaciated pig around, don't you think? Mm. Pigs are supposed to be fat. Um, Courtney, you want to know about natural disasters in this area. Courtney, a natural disaster like you get in Virginia Beach, you mean like a hurricane, we don't really get exactly in this area. But off the coast of Mozambique, what we have is something similar called a cyclone. And a cyclone, I think, is formed, if I'm not mistaken, exactly like by the same phenomena that would cause a, a hurricane. The difference is in uh, surface and, and air temperature, and it is the exact same weather system that occurs here in the southern hemisphere and in the Indian Ocean. So that's only about 200 kilometers or 120 miles from here is the coast, and that's where that happens. Right, we're going to keep driving a little bit quicker to see if we can't just quickly get a view of that breeding herd of buffalo. So that's what we'd have here. Then otherwise, natural disasters would be drought, and then when those cyclones come in, in this area, we don't actually get the... Get the, the, the sort of eye of the storm, if you like, like you would where you are on the coast. But we do get big storms that come in and they will cause flooding, localized flooding in the area. Volcanoes, none. This is a very ancient landscape, which means that the tectonic plates on which we sit are very stable. Uh, the soil is actually fairly nutrient poor because there hasn't been any volcanic activity here for millennia. So those would be no tornadoes. It's too hilly, I think, to have for us to have tornadoes. Some parts of South Africa will have tornadoes, and those are the sort of major natural disasters that we get here. Ah, now, another one of my favorite subjects, Lucas, you and I could sit down and yak about this for ages, which we don't have. So I'll give you a very simple answer. You want to know about what the local diet is? What is the local diet of the indigenous people? Well, in prehistory, before the advent of white man, of the white man here, before the importation of maize, maize of course comes from Mexico, and maize is now the staple diet of people here. White maize, over-refined by so fairly unscrupulous and morally bankrupt uh, milling companies, which basically feed people white maize that is almost nutrient-free. And so we have the situation where, the fa where the, a large proportion of the population is uh, obese, but malnourished at the same time. And that's because of these refined carbohydrates that people eat. So if you're in a poor village like this, you probably have a soft maize porridge for breakfast, maybe some white bread with some jam or margarine, none of which is any good for you, and some tea. Then at lunchtime, you'd have a kind of stiffer maize porridge, which we call pup, or in Shanghai or Shitsong, what we called Vursua, Vursua. And then you'd have that maybe with a tomato and onion relish and maybe some local spinach, which you can either grow yourself or you can harvest in the natural areas. And then for those who have a little bit of money, a dinner might be also vuso, that uh, white maize porridge, and a bit of meat if you can get it. Um, otherwise, some fish maybe from a can, maybe canned pilchards, something like that. Um, and that would be the general diet. Also some chicken. I mean, a lot of people actually keep chickens and every so often they'll kill a chicken and eat that. But traditionally, that would have been that wouldn't have been the diet. Traditionally, people would have eaten probably a lot of game meat. They would have eaten a lot of roots and berries and that sort of thing. Then Jimmy, I think it's Jimmy or Jimmy. You want to know about how the weather? 
just going to get your question again, Jimmy. I think it's how the weather affects the animals out here. Um, Jimmy, the weather affects the animals profoundly out here. The hotter it is, the more they will seek shade. Uh, the wonderful example, we're going to go and look at some buffalo now, is the fact that in summertime, the buffalo will move at night to eat because it's hot in the day, then they'll lie down in the shade for most of the day. And then in winter time, when it's cold at night, they'll sleep in a big huddled group, uh, stay warm, and then they'll move around in the day and eat. So that's what happens seasonally. But basically, the hotter it is and the drier it is, the more time animals want to spend around the water. I don't see any buffalo. Do you? Brian? This is a breeding herd of buffalo. It is the smallest and most invisible breeding herd of buffalo I have ever seen. Apparently they are moving off. Ah, there they are. Okay, I can see them. Let's go around over the top of the damn wall here. brilliant question. Is it easier for animals to get sick from other animals out here? And you were looking at that warthog clearly. And Andrea, I would say it's, I mean, the same a little bit like human beings. But remember that there is no medical attention out here, which means that animals are actually more resilient than we are as human beings. And so that little baby warthog obviously hasn't caught the disease that her mother's got, or highly unlikely that she has. And um, but there are some diseases like bovine tuberculosis, which is a kind of uh, lung infection, or I think it's a bacterial lung infection that uh, cattle get, that the buffalo, like we're hopefully going to see, will also get. And they can, that can be transferred through the air. Absolutely. Excuse me. Hold on tight, everyone. Brian, you're still there? Really? <laughs> Evan, you want to know what the life expectancy of some of the animals is. Well, you get something the size of an elephant shrew, which is a little uh, shrew like that, um, or a bushveld gerbil, which is about the same size, and you'd expect a life expectancy probably of mm, maybe two or three or maybe four years. Then you get buffalo like this. And the buffalo will probably live 14 or 15 years. And then you get the elephants, which will live up to 55 or 60 years. Look at all the buffalo. Now, I know they don't look anything like the buffalo in your country, but these are the African or Cape buffalo. And Andrea, you want to know if the indigenous people here know how to speak any international languages. Absolutely they do. Um, every person in South Africa, when they go to school, must learn English. You have to do English, even if it is as a second language. So while some of the English is um, poor at best, Everybody out here has to learn English. So some of the older people will be unable to speak any English at all, but anybody under the age of, say, I'd say 40, anybody under the age of 40 will have a smattering of English, and the younger the people get, the better their English will be. So yes, everyone has to learn English. And no, nobody out here, indigenous, no indigenous person out here would learn probably any other language. And then, if you go into Mozambique, which is just the other side of the border, everybody will learn Portuguese. So yeah, depends on basically who the colonists were who came out here, depending on what international language the people learn. Hmm. Zachary, you want to know what sports the indigenous people play out here? Well, I mean, the major sport, the fascination of South African people is football just like it is in so many other parts of the world. There are, n there are no major in sort of indigenous games that people play. I suppose like the Irish would have Gaelic football or you would have gridiron football. Um, there are no sort of indigenous sports like that. The major sport that just about every kid wants to play out here is football or what you'd call soccer. So these buffalo have just had a drink, and they will often drink, and especially when it's dry like this, they might drink sort of two or three times a day sometimes. 
and now they'll go for and have something nice to eat in the form of greenish grass. There's a little bit left after the rain we've had, but even those green shoots are now starting to wilt a little bit. <laughs> Jonah, does anyone come to South Africa for vacation? Jonah, millions of people come to South Africa for vacation. More than three million people a year visit the Kruger National Park. That is excluding all of the private reserves that I am basically sitting on, uh, like the ones I'm sitting on, and we're sitting on a place called Juma, which is also a private reserve, part of the Kruger Park. Uh, there are hundreds of them around, and basically, Jonah, conservation of our many of our national parks, if not all of our national parks, is supplemented and maintained by tourists coming here on vacation. Millions and millions of tourists come to South Africa. They come to the Kruger, they go to Cape Town, and they visit lots of the other magnificent places that this country has to offer. There, the buffalo are having a little bit of a run. They may have caught wind or smelt of us. And of course, without tourism, the local people here wouldn't have jobs at all. So many of that, even despite the fact that I said there's a 60 or 70 percent unemployment rate here, those that are employed are largely employed in this area by tourists. So people doing all sorts of jobs related to tourism, cooking and cleaning and guiding and tracking and driving and transport and all sorts of other things like that. We'll go a little bit forward, Brian. Delaney, what a very clever question. You want to know if, the, if there is an overpopulated animal in this area and what is it if there is one? Delaney, I suppose the only overpopulated animal that I can think of is a, an impala. The impala are slightly overpopulated because of the provision of artificial water. Now that's a whole other discussion that we can get into. But basically, in this area, Artificial water has been provided, so water has been pumped from wells for animals to drink, and that's meant that a reduction in biodiversity, uh, lots of impala, lots of zebra, uh, and far less in the way of, say, sable or roan or sesame or hart bears, lots of the different antelope that we used to get. I think this area used to support a far larger group or suite of species, A, and probably number of species as well, when animals were migrating between the perennial rivers and not hanging around kind of permanent water sources like they do now. Nice question, thank you. Now, these buffalo will be trying desperately to avoid lions. Let's just drive down here. And Mr. Singer, you want to know about have we have we um, given additional water to animals? Yes, of course we have, absolutely. In this area, um, every landowner provides a sort of artificially pumped pan or dam. I mean, we just drove over a big dam wall. And so, yes, there's a, quite a large amount of artificial water provision. Mrs. Singer? drive down into this little dry stream and try and get these animals to walk past. Connor, you want to know what our best animal imitation is? Brian, I think we're, we're both probably quite good at the uh, the hardy doll, wouldn't you say? I'd say a turkey is mine. A turkey. Brian, would you like to do your turkey? <laughs> that's, 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 very, <laughs> that's very good. Um, <laughs> Connor? I would like to demonstrate to you the, um, the call of the hardy dar ibis, uh, an impressive bird with a very long bill. You can look up ibis when we leave you. And it goes like this. The buffalo have run away. 
Okay, chaps, that's it from us and Mrs. Mervyn's class. Uh, the rest of you can carry on watching on the internet and uh, stay with us for the next uh, two and a quarter hours. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us, Mrs. Mervyn's class. I hope that was semi-informative uh, for you and what you were looking for. And we will see you, hopefully, at another stage. Have a good day at school and look after yourselves. And that is the thumb saying, learn hard. Learn hard. Buffalo everywhere. <laughs> James Taylor, an interesting question. Do we have a problem with witchcraft? Um, personally, James, I have no problem with witchcraft at all, Brian. No, I don't no? mind. You don't have any problems with witchcraft? No. Um, and that is, of course, a slightly facetious answer. Um, but, James, there is witchcraft. People, absolutely, a lot of the local people have very strong beliefs in um, what the, the, the local verb for it is to lawyer. So if I say in lawyer, it means I'm going to put a spell on you. And there are lots of people that believe that um, spells have been cast on them. Very seldom can they ever figure out who put the, cast, spell, put the spell. Um, but, so, I, the reason I, I mean, I'm not sure I'd describe it as a problem, but there is definitely a very strong belief in um, elements of witchcraft, and there are traditional healers or traditional uh, medicine men, if you like, what I suppose would uh, colonially be called the witch, witch doctor, which we try a word we try and stay away from now, who would um, mix up a potion and say, well, this will do that and this will do that. So, James, yes, it does absolutely, there's still a lot of that sort of thing around here. That's normally, in fact, it's almost always in these rural communities. That said, there was a government minister the other day who said that she couldn't go to meetings uh, because she had been bewitched. Didn't stop her racking up massive bills on her credit card, however. Country West, a very nice question about mining. Um, do they surface mine or deep mine for coal here? I think they do a bit of both, Country West. I mean, I'm not a mining expert by any stretch of the imagination, but a lot of the stuff that I was talking about in Mpumalanga is basically surface mining. And it is doing untold damage to some very precious old areas of South Africa. Okay. Brian, put the camera on. <laughs> Nigel, you want to know if I am a famous celebrity in South Africa and if I get mobbed and asked for my autograph everywhere I go. Don't be modest, James. Oh. Right. Nigel, I'm an immense celebrity. I'm basically the Brad Pitt of South Africa, the Jason Statham of Johannesburg. Nigel, no one knows who I am in South Africa at all. There's absolutely no one who knows who I am in South Africa. I'm not, I'm not a big celebrity by any stretch of the imagination, but thank you for asking. It makes me feel very good indeed. <laughs> today, quite something. Um, Andre, you say you filmed a wedding in your hometown of Howick a little while back, and the master of ceremonies was a kilted fellow who looked a bit like me. Um, I, I would say it's probably quite likely, yes, that it was me. Um, I would suspect that the wedding was the Miller wedding of December the 16th, 2012 or 13. Maybe? <laughs> there we go. 
Ben. That is a that is an astonishing coincidence. Now, Mr. Moustache, you want to know if there's anything from my home that I miss while I'm out here, and I was going to refuse to answer your question because initially I didn't know where you were getting hold of us from this time round. You're back in Iceland now, uh, right? Um, Mr. Moustache, this is kind of my home now, you know. Um, I've got everything that I... everything that I kind of want out here. I've got my guitars, I've got... Uh, I've got a computer that I can send messages to people on and write uh, my thoughts down on. Um, I have people to talk to. I suppose the only thing that I miss from home really would be my, my, my family every so often. My folks live down on the, in the Eastern Cape and my brother lives in Johannesburg and my sister lives in London. But I guess this is pretty much my home now. I mean, if you were to say, what is your home? I'd say probably in the Eastern Cape. And so from home there, I would miss the sea, I guess. But in terms of things of the city, no, not anymore. I certainly used to, but I don't anymore. There's a young buffalo. I don't feel like we've talked about the buffalo at all. They've kind of been an incidental part of this afternoon. Donna, you take me down a road that could get me in trouble, but you're absolutely right. You say, you say we won't interfere with animals out here, but surely providing water is, surely provi oh, there's a tiny little one there, well spotted, Louise. Um, I'm just going to move forward as I answer this, but Donna, yes, absolutely, providing water is completely interfering. There's no question about it. So. You know, where do you draw the line? I don't know. I don't know where you draw the line, and it's really un not up to me to decide, thankfully. There's a tiny little one in there. Was there another one here, Brian? I didn't even see where you were pointing. There we go, a little one. Tiny little calf going through there. That can't be more than a week old. Still a little bit unsure on its feet. That's very sweet. So, Donna, yeah, providing water is... No, there's no question that it changes the biodiversity. Uh, it changes the suite of species that are in an area. Is it a bad thing? No, that's a much more gray area. Uh, is it different from interfering when there's an injured animal? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think you'd certainly have an argument if you said that it wasn't any different. You might be able to argue the other way as well. But I would say it is a gray area, Donna. Nice question. Good one to have a debate and a talk about. I'm not going to drive off road after these guys. These chaps do get a little bit nervous. They're not the most uh, sort of calm buffalo. Mary, you're in Canandoga, New York. That sounds like an interesting place to be, and you want to know if there's anybody in the local villages here that does not have clean running water. Um, yes, everybody, Mary. Everybody, nobody has running water. Unless you're rich enough to have a well or borehole in your stand, I'm afraid everybody out here lacks running water in the indigenous, or not in, in the local villages out here. So Mary, there's a, there are taps, communal taps. I'm going to smack you on the bottom. Buffalo is very tempting. Don't worry, I'm just joking. I won't really smack you on the bottom. But thank you for letting us get this close to you. Good day. <laughs> this is wonderful. I've never been this close to a buffalo here. She's so cool. Just 13 years old, there's a buffalo. Can you see it, Brian? It's that thing there. Really? Oh, that really? one there. Ben, you're 14 and you want to know. Sorry, I've lost your question. I was so astonished by this buffalo. It's, it'll come again. Hello. Oh, Ben, you want to know if 
buffalo ever gore each other when they're in tight herds like this? Uh, ben, it's possible that they could. The bulls, when they fight, might gore each other. It's unusual, though. The fights normally are just head bashing. Uh, look at the ticks. Look at all those ticks. Those are all ticks sucking on the blood of this poor buffalo. And amazingly, she will be able to survive that. I mean, if you had that many ticks on your leg, you'd have tick bite fever for the rest of your days. You need some ox peckers down here, quickly. There's my head, sorry about that. Look at all those ticks. Brian, I can't even hear an ox picker, can you? No. This is very interesting. Pamela, uh, you want to know about nursing water buffalo. Pamela, just remember, before I answer your question, these are not water buffalo. These are Cape or African buffalo. Water buffalo is a very similar looking but distantly related cousin of the African or Cape buffalo that occurs in Asia and an introduced version into Australia. Now, how long does the African buffalo nurse? I think it's up to a year, if I'm not mistaken. Probably a bit, no, it must be less than that, but it's probably, I actually don't know. I can't believe this, I've forgotten it. I'm gonna say six months, but we're gonna have to check for you. Sorry, Pamela, let's check when the weaning is. I think it's about six months. Now that one, I mean, this chap's only about a year old and he's eating grass voraciously. <laughs> Cat in your in Tampa, you've been using, yeah, I had no idea that this thing existed. Uh, you've been using Twitter extensively, obviously, and there's something on Twitter called the fact in your face for the day, or is that what it's called, fact in your face? And you say, is it true? Fact in your face page. Well, I think it's quite something. It sounds quite forceful, really. Um, the fact in your face page said to you that dung beetles are able to navigate by the stars, by the Milky Way. Is that true? Yes, it is true for some of them, I believe. Remember, there are only 900... There over 900 species of dung beetle. Some of them navigate with a mite. Uh, it's a, like a parasitoid that lives on top of the dung beetle. And somehow, if you take all the mites off, they can't find dung anymore. But I've definitely read an article, and it was in the distant recesses of my mind, where it explained how it is that dung beetles are able to fly using the Milky Way. And I think it's why they don't fly on cloudy nights. And I think if you... Absolutely, they do experiments where they've put them in kind of controlled situations and then they move like a planetarium where they will move the stars around and the dung beetles will fly according to different directions from following the light of the stars. Yeah, brilliant. Isn't that amazing? Thank you, Kat. So I would, my, I may subscribe myself to the fact in your face. Buffalo do apparently wean at six months. Let me just turn around here. This is the most confiding buffalo cow in the Sabi Sands. She's fantastic. Now, Jamie, you want to know what we eat in camp, basically, and can we get the same foods that we get in town? Uh, or can we get the same food in camp that we get in town? Uh, Jamie, pretty much exactly the same. Our food comes from a large supermarket retail store uh, in Hootsprate. The selection is definitely smaller. I mean, we can get pretty much everything that we would eat at home. Brian, is there anything particular that you would miss? What do you like to eat? Sushi. Sushi? We can't get sushi in Hootsprate. Well, I think we can. Actually. You probably, in fact, I think you can. Whether you should eat it or not is an entirely different matter. Yeah. <laughs> um, fish. 
in the low felt is not a sort of delicacy you want to be eating. Um, the one thing we do struggle with, though, interestingly, is kind of really good fresh produce because very little of it is is produced here locally. And I mean, the amazing thing there's a I mean, there's a chain called Woolworths, which is in the UK it would be the equivalent of your M&S, and. There's one in Palabor, which is not too far north from here, but some of the lettuce, for example, that they will sell you is picked locally, sent to a market in Johannesburg, 600 kilometers away, packed there, and then sent back again. So, I mean, astonishingly, it's, it's actually quite difficult to get hold of local produce out here. Uh, we do get our green produce from a... Uh, sort of uh, local communal farming project, which is very nice. But interestingly, you can't get, that's often some of the most difficult things to get, fresh fruit and that sort of thing, uh, because everything grown in the area is sent to the big packing houses in Johannesburg or Pretoria, and then sent around the country. I don't miss anything particular from home, I don't think. As long as I've got decent coffee to drink, I'm fine. Steve, if you ask a question, I really don't think that I'm qualified to answer, uh, given that I'm not a divine being. You want to know if the buffalo ears are attached upside down in order to make them look more grumpy. Um, Brian? Potentially, maybe. Potentially, maybe. I like that answer. Potentially, maybe, Steve. It certainly does help them to look a little bit more severe, doesn't it? Let's move a little bit further up here, and then I think we'll probably leave these beefs to themselves. But just to reiterate, for those of you who've tuned in and wondering why you are saddled with my voice droning at you for such an abominable length of time, uh, Scott is unfortunately not allowed or not able to go out because Wendy has returned, and we're still rewiring her and Jigger has gone to hospital, which is where Jigger belongs, permanently. So Scott will be back with us tomorrow morning. Now, I was just thinking about this, James Richard. You say Scott was with his buffalo herd this morning, and he was also worried about the lack of ox peckers. I've just seen two flying off over there. I can hear them going now. Psh, 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 psh. So they're around, but I agree, they're not a lot of them. I don't know why that would be. It's very worrying. I mean, they're a very crucial part of the ecosystem out here. Let me just get, try and get a little bit closer to the front of the herd. Sharon, you're in Belito, which I believe is a very nice seaside town near Durban. I haven't actually been there myself. Sharon, you want to know if there is a weak buffalo herd born, buffalo herd, if there is a weak buffalo calf born, will the herd look after it as an elephant herd might, or will they just leave it? Um, Sharon, to a certain extent they'll look after it, but if it cannot keep up with the herd, they certainly are not going to sacrifice themselves for it, and it will be left to um, basically be eaten, I'm afraid. So a very weak buffalo herd, with some t a buffalo calf with some kind of sickness, the herd will unfortunately leave. Nice question, thank you, Sharon. question from you, and I think it's an interesting point. You say, is a drought not nature's way of giving the predators an advantage, while at the same time allowing the land time to rest? Ravi, the first part of your question would be, sure, would be yes. Uh, I suppose it, you could say that if you 
believed that nature had some kind of um, overall desire for health, then yes, I would agree that the drought was a good thing for the carnivores and certainly it will change the balance of predators to prey. But remember now, Ravi, in a drought like this, although there will be animal die-off, the only reason that there is animal die-off is because the land has been eaten flat. So it doesn't actually provide that much of a rest for the land until it gets seriously advanced. Hello, Ashley in England. I want to know about the bush news. I'm just going to assume you haven't been watching for a little while. You want to know about any leopard movements and lion movements and rain that we might have had. And that's a really nice opportunity to give a bit of an update. You also say you're sad about Scott and Nikki. I think we're all very sad about Scott and Nikki, but you know, um, it's time for them to go exploring, perhaps. Anyway, we'll get on to that later, we'll be celebrating them over the course of the weekend. Um, Ashley, in terms of leopard movements, we had some female tracks coming in from the south today and then heading out again. Karula has been concentrating in that area. Does she still have cubs? Possibly. Uh, would be very, very nice, very exciting, beyond exciting if that were to be the case. Um, Shadow, we haven't heard of for a while. She's been around Arethusa, I know, but you know, also in a fairly concentrated area, so that's a possibility. Lions, we've had, over the last few days, some very nice lion sightings. We had the Nkuhuma pride around the place, and then we had one female on her own, one of the Nkuhumas, the one with the, uh, she's most, how she most easily, she had quite slanty eyes. She's most easily identified by her slanty eyes. And she was with one of the Birmingham boys, one with a scarred face. He looks like he's been mauled by, a, I, I don't know, he looks like he's been mauled by a steel brush over the top of his face. He's a small lion. I know that when you see them initially, you think they're quite big, but he's not, they're not big, those Birmingham boys. They're not large fellows. And this guy is a, well, he's, a, he's an okay size, but it's there. You can see that they are, they're fighting. I don't know if they're fighting with each other, but they've certainly got scars all over them. Anyway, he was seen on the cheetah cut line with that lioness a few days ago, and then he was found again yesterday on Juma. I don't know where the other three are. I think they were, they were, no, I do know. They were on Torchwood and then they were on Nkuru after that. So I'm not sure why he split up from them. We don't know where the Nkuhuma Pride is at the moment. They were on Sumbambili yesterday. I think they were on Sumbambili yesterday. Wild dogs were there too this morning. And then what else happened? Oh, the hyenas moved house. They moved home. They moved to Aubrey's Road. They no longer wish to be on Mbubu Road. And so they've moved off to Aubrey's. I'm just turning the game drive radio up in case a great plethora of animals is being seen, and I don't know about it. Um, and we had a little bit of rain, actually. Almost exactly a week ago, we had 20 millimeters of rain, which is almost an inch, and it's created a flush of green, but not on all the reserves. So, I mean, in this particular area, it looks quite nice and green now. We've got some green grass on the fire break here. But if you go further east, along, say, around Ledwood Road, which is in the southeastern corner, uh, it's actually quite dry still. Let us carefully ease our way down here. <laughs> Hello, Debbie, in Vancouver. Um, Debbie, you say, would I include the drought as a natural disaster, given that I didn't include it as a natural disaster when I talked to the kids? Um, Debbie, we've just been talking about the drought already, and so I kind of assumed that they would assume it was a natural disaster, but absolutely I would. I would definitely consider it a natural disaster. What? Disaster? Upheaval, yes. Disaster? not so sure. For the farmers in the country at the moment, a huge disaster. Out here, yeah, I'm just not so convinced that it's that much of a disaster yet. Right, let us drive at a relatively decent lick to get to Bivelshoek Dam, so that we might find something there. But before, we must just be careful, Brian, remember those warthogs that like to come out of their burrow. It's just up here. I don't think they'll be home yet. 
a termite mound just up here in which two sows and five little babies live. This is an amazing thing to see. There it is. It's, it's, that, it's that mound there. You see that mound there, Brian? Tony, while we look for these uh, warthog, you want to know if there are coffee plantations in South Africa. Um, I don't think there are. I know there's a company called the Sabi River Valley Coffee Company. But I think they're a roasting company. I don't think they actually grow coffee here. I don't think it's wet enough. Yes, they're definitely not home yet. That is their home, though. In the last few nights I've come past here, the sow sticks her head out. She doesn't like it when you stop near here. And then she comes bucketing out. And she, her friend comes bucketing next, probably her sister. And then they are followed by five little piglets. So maybe we'll catch them going in there a little bit later. I'm sure they're out grazing at the moment. Mm -hmm. Also quite a nice European roll up there, Brian. Beautifully lit so that you'll just get a black blob on the uh, black blob on the branch. Hmm, is that identifiable, isn't it? Oh, definitely a roller, everybody. Definitely European. Oh, there we go. We've got a bit of blue there. Maroon brown on the back. Definitely a European roller. And even if we just had the silhouette, everyone, we would know because it's just got that roller shape. And of course. We use the term GIS, general impression size and shape, and that's what, it's just got the GIS of a roller, it just looks like that. It's got a little tooth on the end of its beak for catching insects, and it's just got that shape. Sitting perched out, exposed, looking for insects on the ground, which it'll leap down and grab at the earliest available opportunity. On we go, Brian. Let us forge ahead fearlessly into the sun, into the blinding sun. Julie, this is quite exciting. You're in York in the United Kingdom, North Country, of course, and you want to know if there are any hippo that have, um, we've lost any hippo here because your brother, who's in Kruger now, has seen a number of dead hippo. Jilly, we haven't lost any hippo here, but remember, Kruger itself, proper, where your brother is, is probably, f it's definitely further east of here. And exponentially, the rain has reduced as you go from the mountains to the east, and Kruger's having a much worse time of it than even we are here. So, it, it definitely, the... Kruger hippos are really struggling. Now this, everybody, is where the leopard kill was. It was in this thicket. We didn't, we could see the kill. Oh, the kill's still there. You see it there, Brian? You just go back a bit. I don't, I think this leopard's abandoned this kill. You see where I'm looking, Brian? I, I know it is, I can't. You can't actually you know, get a picture of it. It's in the middle of this tree, everyone. And I just go past very slowly every time to see if I can maybe see the spots of a leopard watching. And I know that what I'm looking at now is a log. I'm going to look anyway. It is a log. I think he's abandoned that kill. Hmm. Oh, Ravi. Ravi, you want to, you say that you reckon that our buffalo here are relatively closely related to domestic cattle? Yes, they are. And you say, well, obviously, 
beef are grain fed and some of them eat a little bit of grass and how do I think that that affects their metabolism? Ravi, I think it affects their metabolism very poorly to be honest. I think that's why we have steak with such a, a you know, huge layer of, of yellow fat on it. That is caused by the grains that animals eat. They are not evolved to eat grain. No cattle, no human being, no animal is evolved to eat grain in the quantities that we eat it. And so there is a huge issue with it, I think. And I think it's, um, well, first of all, it's not particularly environmentally friendly to be feeding it to them. Secondly, what it does is that often you get them eating this kind of, um, what's it called, Roundup Ready maize. Which, and Roundup Ready, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a genetically modified maize that you can spray. Basically, you can spray it with any, any pesticide in the world, and it will kill every known plant except this particular maize species. Now, what happened is, what happens is that the, uh, the cattle eats the stuff, and it deposits something called glycosate in the fat. And that glycosate is a carcinogenic substance. So when you are feeding your cattle Roundup Ready maize, which is, I mean, is most of the maize that I think it's most of the maize we get at the moment, you're actually, I mean, you're creating some serious problems. Cattle, like I say, not evolved to eat them, to eat that stuff. Um, cattle are evolved to eat grass, and if you eat a grass-fed piece of beef, it will have a much smaller amount of fat, and that fat is obviously very good for you, but it doesn't have any of the chemicals. There's some elephants, Brian. Just gonna drive a bit quicker. Luckily, coming on to Juma. So, Ravi, yeah, I, I mean, I think, for me, if I can, I will only eat grass-fed beef, and only a very little of it making a nasty noise on the tire there. Anyway, we'll hope the wheel doesn't fall off. Um, so yeah, Ravi, I think, does, does that answer your question? I think there is a, there's a real issue, especially with feedlot, mass-produced beef, mass-produced any lamb, pork, you name it. If it's grain-fed, you can be pretty sure that it's po probably not very good for you. Remember that a, a, a cow or a giraffe or a buffalo is evolved to regurgitate grass, chew it, and then re-swallow it. And we'll hear some eddies. Beautiful. And of course, you don't need to re- Oh, this, this is my favorite little herd. It's a herd with a cut-off trunk mum. We'll call her half trunk mum. There she is with her little fall. And why don't we look at them? Ig, thank you very much. You said there are coffee plantations, and the Sabi River uh, Valley Coffee Company does grow their own stuff, and there is one also in Natal. Thank you, Ig. In Pretoria, Ignatius. Little one. Now, probably what, four weeks, five weeks old? Tiny little baby. And I'm still not sure if the other two in this herd are either her siblings or perhaps her offspring. I think one of them is her offspring. I think that the other little one is her offspring. And I think the bigger one is perhaps a sibling. Let's go back a bit. Brian and I have extensive experience with this herd. Um, during the trials, or not the trials, the rehearsals that we did for the Big Cat Week, one of the trials we did, uh, we sat with this herd, what, four hours, three hours? <laughs> and the, the elephants eventually got so bored of us that they went to sleep, all four of them. All, there was only three at that stage. Try and ease our way in here. A lovely herd, and I'm just so impressed that this cow with her half trunk has managed to raise, create, forge herself a little herd, successfully breed, maybe have three youngsters. Possibly just the two though. Mm. Hold on everyone. Look at 
suckling. Just run the suckling there. Or trying to. Mum's not standing very still. <laughs> Nearly tripped over the log. So sweet. If they go into that thick stuff, everyone, I'm going to leave them to go. I don't want to kind of disturb them too much. There's a little one here. They'll be eating grass as much as they can at the moment. Instead of the hard bushes and leaves. Let's go a little bit closer. Oh. Zoe, <laughs> thank you very much for your kind compliment. You say I'm an excellent public speaker. Um, Zoe, that is very kind of you. And you say, was I ever nervous um, as a youngster public speaking? Yes, I was, but only when I was unprepared. So I think preparation for me as a public speaker is the most important thing to not being nervous. Don't hide behind the bush, elephant. That elephant has almost disappeared. Almost completely invisible there. In a very unfortunate state of affairs. I'm going to go a little bit forward, but I'll see if we can sneak in the middle there. Gracie, aged eight. You're not feeling so well today, I don't think. And you say you love elephants and they make you feel a bit better. Well, I'm very glad they make you feel a bit better, Gracie. We'll spend a good deal of time with these elephants. Then if we can, if we can't, we'll try and find some others. Now, Gracie, I have a very special message from you from Scott today. And he was going to have a tea party with you today, but because Wendy is not working properly, He's going to have to have his tea party with you tomorrow. So please don't fear. He's just giving you what we call a rain check. He's going to have tea with you tomorrow. I don't know that I can get any closer to these chaps, I'm afraid. They've gone to some rather thick stuff to eat. The Combretum trees and the silver cluster leaf trees the Zizifus trees, and in the case of that little one, have a drink of milk. Now, we were talking today, this morning, about tusks, and somebody asked the question about what is the purpose of tusks, or what are they for, and I spoke about the groove that sometimes forms on an elephant's tusk from where she uses it to break off branches. Now, an elephant like this one that we're looking at here, has got a very defined groove, and that's because she uses her tusk there. You can just see it there. She uses her tusk more than most elephants would because her trunk is obviously not prehensile. It doesn't have that sort of uh, two-fingered hand on the bottom of it, which means she uses her tusks more than other elephants do, and so that groove is a lot more marked. And I mean, there's no question that, that tusk will eventually fall off. Over there, and she's gonna have to make a new groove perhaps on the other tusk. And as you can very easily see from that, elephants are either left or right tusked, depending. I'm not sure if it's, uh, they actually are left or right tusked or if it's actually just a habit that forms. But I hope rather like with us, and in fact, they twist their trunks in normally only a right direction or a left direction. And I hope for her sake, that she learns to use her other hand a bit more easily than human beings learn to use their wrong hands. And be trunkstress. You like that word, Brian? I did. Mm.
James Richard, you say very interestingly in the parts of the U.S. there are some moose that are being taken out by a great explosion of ticks at the moment. And if there was an animal out here, would um, would it happen? Or I mean, w w if there was an outbreak here, would it happen here, James? I can't imagine that it would. You know, um, I would imagine that either that tick has been introduced to the area and is therefore unfamiliar or the, you know, the moose's uh, immune system is unable to deal with the parasites introduced by those ticks, or perhaps there is some kind of, I don't know, nutritional deficiency or other biological reason for why that should happen. Maybe they're, I don't know, some kind of an, an uber, an uber batch of ticks that are just not a not uh, susceptible to the defenses that the moose have. That is fascinating. I'm really interested by that. I can't imagine a situation like that occurring here with the natural ticks and in the course of a natural sort of cycle of things. Of course, a drought will bring out things like anthrax. Uh, it certainly will make those spores more likely to affect animals. But I mean, that again is a fairly natural thing. Oh, that little elephant. It's too sweet. Now, I love the color there of the green and the gray. <laughs> Ravi, a question. I'm, I, I'm not sure which part of your question or which which way you're leaning you're saying you you think the drought would probably affect bushfires um in some way it does affect the bushfires but i think probably in a sort of counterintuitive way to the way many people think it would there is no grass during a drought of course you can see the grass is very low it's about an eighth of the length it would be normally at this time of year and so ravi what that means is that there we go, there we go, thank you, Brian. What that means is that there will be no fire, no fire at all. Remember, a fire that comes through here uses grass as the fuel load, not these trees. These trees are extremely fire resistant, and unless they have a massive load of grass underneath them, they will not catch fire. So the trees, at the moment, we, I mean, I wouldn't even bother to burn a fire break during this next dry season because I really don't think that fire is going to be a problem for us until we get the next big rains and the next big growth season. So it's completely unlike a big bushfire that would go through the eucalyptus of Australia or the gum trees or those enormous fires you have in California which go through the pines, I think. I mean, where the trees actually kind of explode into life. When, they, when the fire goes through the area, those are wattled starlings flying about there. That's quite nice to see. Um, I've, been, I've seen pictures of those fires going, sort of exploding from treetop to treetop. And that just doesn't happen here. These fires are, these uh, leaves and trees are tremendously fire resistant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm afraid we can't really go any... <laughs> Let me try and just sneak a little bit closer. This is too good to miss. There's a big log in front of us there, everybody. And if I make too much noise, they'll run. Look at the birds. <laughs> this is awesome. I've never seen this before. I think it's just because they get bored, you know. There's a mother just throwing a tree out of the way. And of course, that's exactly what those starlings want. And she's moved that tree, and that's exactly what the starlings want because she will unearth a whole lot of grubs and insects that they can then go and eat. So if 
the little son wasn't chasing them around all over the place. Could be a daughter. I just said son. I don't know if it is or not. Um, <laughs> if he wasn't chasing them all over the place, they'd be happily eating some grubs and insects. And I'm reliably informed by Kirsten McLean Smith that she has seen a video of the Kruger Park where an elephant baby was chasing some birds. Thank you, Kirsten. Perhaps a biology teacher. So a post is your, is your next uh, vacation. You can just see the tail there. Right, Brian, I'm not going to put you underneath this knob thorn tree. I think, uh, oh, thank you. I think it might be uncomfortable. Um, a little bit. Yeah, I might move your hat, your head, as to the rest of you. See, look at those vicious thorns, everyone. Brian doesn't want to go through those. No. No, fair enough, Brian. I, I mean, I quite understand. Thank you, James. So thoughtful. I am. I, I like to do what I can for the downtrodden. <laughs> There is a squiddle alarm calling over there. I'm just going to have a quick look there. And then I think we're going to head just down the road to Sydney's Dam. Brian, I think we're up there. Jenny. <laughs> You want to know I get my sense of humour from my mother or my father. Um, Jenny, first of all, I'm... Greetings. I'm most, uh, I'm most pleased that you think I have a sense of humour. Some don't. Uh, some think that I am completely without humour at all. And that's, um, that's always very distressing to me. But I do, I do thank you very much that you have noticed that I am attempting some form of comedy sometimes. Uh, it definitely comes from my father. My father is a... Uh, uh, fairly similarly, um, people have been similarly confused about whether or not he has a sense of humour. So that's where that comes from. And my mother has a similar taste in humour, but she is not, um, she's not as quite as sarcastic or offensive as I am. There are some Franklins over here. And then we're going to go to the dam. I don't see anything that squirrels should be shouting at. We're also not too far from the hyena den, but I think we'll go there a bit later. Right. Very, very nice question and comment from Alistair in Johannesburg, my old hometown. Alistair, very astute. You say, of course, World Wildlife Day, which is today, was introduced by the United Nations in order to raise awareness of wildlife, plants, animals, and all the other biota that live out here. And you want to know about jackals specifically and why we don't see them here, or do we see them here? Um, Alistair, hold that thought for exactly 15 seconds. Over here, Alistair, just two days ago, I saw the first black back jackal I've ever seen in the Sabi Sands. And it came bucketing in and it stole some meat from a kill that hyenas had already pilfered from 12 wild dogs. And almost with impunity, they didn't kind of even, nobody paid it any attention. They were too busy fighting with each other. And the black backed jackal leapt in, took a bit of knot and ran off and then came back and he was knocking about here. And it was the most fantastic thing to see. I've never seen a black backed jackal in this particular area. I think I did see one once down Glondolozy. They're not common here. We do get the side-striped jackal every so often, which is a slightly, I mean, population-wise, is much less common than the black-backed. I'm not sure why we don't see so many of them here. 
it might be that they're in a sort of transition zone where, you know, between where the two species replace each other. Certainly down south towards Natal, you get largely the side-striped jackal and not the blackback. But up where I used to work at Ngala, which is not too far from here, just the other side of the Manileti, every single clearing there had a pair of blackback jackals in it. And, I mean, they were wonderful entertainment. So, no, we, I mean, we would show them if we got them. So, I mean, Brian, if you just put the camera over there, if you don't mind. That's the kind of clearing that a blackback jackal pair would live in. And this chap was on his own, so I don't know where he came from. But it was wonderful to see him. I got very excited indeed. Nice question. Thank you, Alistair. Here we are at the water. Brian, what do you think is going to be here? Right. Yeah, hippo. Is that a hippo? Out of the water, in the sun. Looks like a large slug at this distance. There's also an elephant moving off there. There are two elephants moving off there. Let me just go forward. We might get a better view. Three elephants moving off there. Hmm. That's an interesting one from Janet in Boston. Let's just have a look here. That hippo is going to be difficult to see. Sorry. Anyway, he's kind of below a lip there. Uh, some water buck coming down to drink. So let's just have a look at them. More squirrels alarm calling, probably at nothing, maybe at a blackback jackal. Very nice view of the water bucks. Um, Janet, you want to know if elephants prefer, this is quite an interesting one, Elephants prefer trees that have got insects in them to eat. In other words, would they select branches that have insects on them? Presumably, Janet, uh, you're suggesting that they might like to eat insects. I think it's possible, Janet. I don't know for sure. Except to say that what they do do, hippo, uh, elephants, is break off branches and then shake them out. So maybe not. Maybe they try and avoid the insects. Maybe they don't have the stomachs to digest things other than sort of herbivorous material. Um, but I wonder if they wouldn't maybe suck on the odd bone. And I know that they engage in geophagia, so they will sometimes eat uh, stones and that sort of thing. So it's quite possible, Janet. Now, where are my two friends? Do you see them, Brian? There. I see them. No. Is that a bird? I'm looking for a crocodile, everyone. That's an island with birds on it. It's not a crocodile. There were two crocodiles in here at one stage, verified by Brent Leo Smith. And there's also a squirrel going ballistic in front of us. So I'm just going to sit here for a little while. Um, Lisa, roll on me. You sent through a question which I have now forgotten because my train of thought was completely arrested by the thought of looking for some crocodiles. So I'm sure it will be returned to my right ear forthwith. Ah. Here's it's an interesting one. You want to know why African people have not domesticated buffalo for consumption? The reason, Lisa, is because they're not domesticatable. Lisa, the Africa is full of animals that have evolutionary equivalents in various parts of the world that might be considered um, domesticatable. Buffalo, horse, um, zebra, they've never, also never been domesticated. And the reason for that is that we evolved in Africa with those animals. And what that means is that since we climbed out of the trees, since our ancient ancestors climbed out of the trees, they've been flinging stones and sticks and killing and beating up um, all of the animals out here. And that's why they have a natural fear and propensity to bash us if we go anywhere near them. Now, the same cannot be said. For example, a really, really nice example would be the um, the ancient ancestor or the... What is that? Right? Mm 
I didn't know better, I would say it was an osprey. Can't be. That's what the squirrels are alarm calling at. Everybody, this is fascinating. I don't know what that bird is. Let me get out my book. So, Lisa, basically, the answer is that the animals here are not domesticatable. They evolved with people, and therefore, they show a disturbing propensity to homicide if you go too close to them. Buffalo, great example. Zebra are vicious, for example. Um, yeah, the Bushmen came close with something called a... She was... They came close with something called an eelunt, which is a very large tragolaphid or kudu-like antelope. I think that's a bat hawk, right? I can't believe that. Everybody, help me out here, but I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that that's a bat hawk. Except the feet are the wrong color. The feet are definitely brown. So maybe it isn't a bat hawk. But what we're looking at is a very skinny head. It's got white under feathers. So I think it's probably a juvenile, given its mottled appearance. It's got a long beak. Very obviously long beak. Not a true eagle. See, it's not feathered all the way down to the bottom of its feet. That is astounding. There's the battle, Brian. We will show you these pictures, everyone, but let's just keep an eye on the bird for now. He's got that little bit of white behind his head. I'm just going to keep looking. A bat hook is also 45 centimeters. That's about one and a half feet. Do you think that's about the right size? to be any of the goshawks that we get here, and he doesn't look anything like a goshawk. Or a honey buzzard, maybe. No, they've got yellow feet. All of these things have got yellow feet, except the step buzzard. That's not a step buzzard, though. It could be. It could possibly be a juvenile fish eagle. Oh, maybe 63 centimeters, what do you think? Maybe. Oh, look, it's got a yellow eye. See that? It's got a yellow eye. Very obvious yellow eye. It's a juvenile brown snake eagle. It's not nearly as exciting as I was hoping it was going to be. Damn it. Oh, well. I'll show you a picture, everyone. And I'll show you the bat hawk as well. I, was, I mean, I'm really stretching for the bat hawk because I was hoping it would be a bat hawk, but it is not. Pretty sure it's a juvenile brown snake eagle. There's the juvenile brown snake eagle there. Ooh, he's just turned around. Yeah, I think that's him there. Juvenile brown snake eagle, obvious, obvious yellow, yellow eye. And he's got that kind of motley brown, and he's probably somewhere between the juvenile and the adult. And I'll quickly show you the bat hawk, which is a very special bird because it catches. Brown? What do you think of bat hawk hawks? Eats? No, 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 that's incorrect. Try again. Um, <clears throat> uh, um, bat. Yes, well done. Yes, that's him there. That's the bat hawk. And I, I thought it might be a bat hawk simply because it's got that little bit of sort of white there, the back of the head, and that's what I was seeing. That's the juvenile. But I think the shape is wrong, and it's definitely got very pale legs, whereas that thing has got very obviously brown legs. Anyway. He's turned around now, and is now looking much more brown snake eagle-like. Hmm. Oh, well. You know, you live in hope, everyone. You live in hope. OK, we're going to leave Sydney's water hole here, where there are a couple of water buck having a drink. So, Foreign Dean, just before we leave, you want to know there's a bird's nest in the water. 
Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, there's one that's fallen out. Um, in the trees there are some red-billed buffalo weaver's nest, say that after a morning without coffee. Red-billed buffalo weaver. And just below there, Safari Dean, you've noticed exactly that one of the nests has come out. And just beyond that is a, Brian, crocodile. Do you see it? It has just broken the surface. Ha! And has sunk down again. Nasty little submarine. Hmm. I think that's, well, I'm not convinced again. <laughs> it looked like a crocodile on the screen, but it didn't look so much like a crocodile when I looked at the water. <laughs> Deborah, Andre Chavre, you reckon that was a cuckoo hawk? I didn't have a thought about a cuckoo hawk, but I'll show you why it isn't a cuckoo hawk. Just quickly, just because we're on our own and we've got time to do what we like tonight. Cuckoo hawk. I'll show you why it's not a cuckoo hawk. Here's the cuckoo hawk, or buzzer. And you can see there, well, first of all, it's too small. It's only 40 centimeters, which is about a, uh, basically just over a foot. And you can see the coloration is just wrong, completely wrong. Even for the juvenile there, it's got very, very br brown, obviously brown legs. And this thing's got yellow legs and a yellow sear, which that one doesn't have. So not a cuckoo hawk, I'm afraid. Nice thought, though. I did also think about looking at the cuckoo hawk, probably mainly because I wanted to see a cuckoo hawk. Yeah, and you can just see, when he turns his head like that, that crest that comes up with a bit of a breeze behind him, very typical of the brown snake eagle, which eats, um, Brian, in fact... Bats. Bats, yes. <laughs> Exactly correct. And you're a genius. You're an ornithological genius, Brian. <laughs> yes, Gracie, don't worry. We <laughs> I must tell Scott that you can only come have a tea party tomorrow afternoon uh, because you are not allowed to watch during the morning drive because you have to go to sleep. Uh, that is fine, Gracie. That is what Scott's understanding is. We know that we can only have tea with you in the afternoon. I'm going to let you and Scott start off tea without me. Uh, you, apparently you're wearing your Cinderella dress. That's marvellous. Good idea. I'm sure Scott will be most impressed. And um, I will join you sometime during the tea, and uh, we will enjoy it. And um, I'll be interested to know what Scott is going to wear to the tea break. I think, without question, it will be well worth waiting to see. So I'll see you at tea, Gracie. Definitely something stuck in the tyre. We're not going to worry about it there. No time, you know. Um, you, any chance of finding a large owl or two this evening? Simon, absolutely, we'd do our best to find a large owl or two. I would very much like to see a large owl or two. Um, I just, I'm kind of a little suspicious about it because I haven't seen one for a while. But large owls we could see, which are totally unrelated to the European rotor sitting over there. Large owls we would see would include a giant eagle owl with its little pink eyelids, a spotted eagle owl, which is a bit smaller with yellow eyes. Looks like sort of a standard issue picture book owl. And then we might also get large owls that we'd get. And we get much smaller ones, the white-faced scops owl, sort of medium-sized, and the little scops owl, barred owl, and pearl-spotted owl are obviously much smaller. Isn't it lovely, that blue color? I wonder if he's not disguised like that in the same way that the, um, I see uh, his Louise is just saying we can see the tooth on the edge of his beak, which is used to um, impale his insect prey. 
I've always liked the word impale. Don't you think it's effective, Brian? Mm. Mm. Impale. But his coloration is very much like that of, say, a, um, I don't know, I guess a Spitfire, uh, you know, the fighter plane of old, which was colored blue underneath so that if you were looking up trying to shoot at it, you couldn't see it. And if you were looking down at it uh, with the same intent, perhaps in this case, trying to grab it as a hawk or a, um, an African hawk eagle or a falcon, uh, he'll look a bit camouflaged with all of that brown on his back. It's maybe. Maybe. What do you think, Brian? Do you think it's possible? Yeah, possibly. Possibly, maybe. Mm, good. Potentially, maybe. Good. On we go. Watch out there, bird. Impale. Absolutely, we could be living more consciously. And would that have a, a positive effect on ecosystems around the world? I've no doubt it would. But are we living... Who are those, Brian? Beefaloes going across the road. Um, but are we living in a manner that is contrary to our nature? You see, I don't think we are. And I think that's quite an interesting concept. And I think it's because of the advent of technology that we're able to kind of... Um, almost thwart nature's efforts for now. Uh, does that answer your question, Robbie? So, difficult, difficult subjects, and of course hundreds of people will have a hundred different answers to a question like that. Very nice. Luke the Duke. An interesting question. We've just been past the site of the abandoned leopard kill. And you want to know why on earth a leopard would abandon it? Uh, pressure, simply pressure from other leopards, hyenas, humans, you name it. We haven't driven in there, nor has anyone else driven in there, so I don't think it's human beings. But certainly there were some uh, hyenas around there when I came through the other day, and they would have lain about underneath the kill there. Maybe he just thought, ah, you know, I can go and catch something else without the pressure of cars driving up and down the road the whole time. I mean, the traffic that we provide on this road is negligible compared with the up and downing that goes on between drives here. So I think he probably just decided it was a bit noisy and unpleasant for him in his dining room and he was going to go elsewhere. I think that's what it was. There are the buffalo coming across the road. You can just about see them. Shrike or Jackie Hangman bird. 
and it is a um, it's a shrike species, obviously. That's why it's called that's why it's called a fiscal shrike. And while we just drive through these buffalo, I'm not going to stop for them again because we did have a long look at them earlier. Uh, the fiscal shrike is a black and white bird that likes to it'll catch say a, a large insect and then stick it almost like a pantry onto a thorn or onto a barbed wire fence if it lives in an agricultural area. And it's called now a common fiscal. Not even called a shrike. There's a little one, Brian. There's a tiny little one. Don't run away, little one. I'm sure that's the same one we saw just now. Very sweet. Looks deeply confused with life. And already, as Louise is pointing out, its horns are starting to erupt. And it's still so little. Probably only if, well, it must be maybe a month old then if its horns are coming out already. But mum is starting to lose condition. And it's the first time I've looked at this herd of buffalo and thought, hmm, things are perhaps getting a bit tough. The cattle out in the communities at the moment look like a sort of warmed up death at the moment. Mm. And bones sticking out all over the place. And until fairly recently, I felt like the buffalo were actually doing okay. But at the moment now, I mean, if you look at that lot, they start, their hip bones are starting to show. So I think times are not easy for them. Um, Robin, there's the common fiscal, or the fiscal shrike. And he's also got the tooth, which is typical of the shrikes and the rollers. And he will impale his prey on a thorn or on the barbed wire fence. Very nice. Impale, Brian. Mm. Mm. Try and think of other pleasant words. While we are driving along alone, um, I would be very nice if you would send through um, perhaps your favorite word. Uh, not in your favorite bush word, your favorite word that relates to the bush felt out here. Hashtag Safari Life, questions at wildearth.tv or on the YouTube channel function. Your favorite bush word. Elephant, lion, lion doesn't count unless you're less than 30 years old. I'm going to get to your question now. I'm just going to quickly listen to the radio. There's some lions on Torchwood. Torchwood is the reserve to the east of us, and um, we are not allowed to go there at this stage. Laura Kraft, um, you want to know, do I think all animals see in black and white? Um, animals don't see in black and white so much as being color blind. Now, I think Brian, it was you who was telling me that it's, it's greens and blues more that they see. And things like red, for example, are almost invisible to them. Uh, well, certainly the reds or chestnuts of an impala or a nyala will be very difficult for a predator to see. But it's a variation. It's not, it's not a blanket um, kind of color blindness. What, it ha what happens is that if nocturnal animals, for example, will be almost completely color blind, and that's because they have a ratio. There's a there's a ratio of cells in everybody's eye. Uh, if I do lose you through here, I'll carry on the conversation as we go through. But basically, you've got two kinds of cells in your eye: rods and cones. Rods see light and dark or contrast, cones see color. Now, I don't know the mechanism by which all of that happens, but basically the amount of color you can see depends on that ratio. So animals that don't see well at night, like us, and like many bird species, there are more buffalo, which we will just gently ease past. Hello, BBs. So Laura, animals that don't see so well at night, like birds and us, see well in color. Animals that see very well at night, like lions and hyenas and leopards, you probably find are almost completely color blind. Now, in between that, I think you'll find a continuum. I think you'll find that cheetah probably see pretty well in color. You'll probably
probably find that wild dogs can see a bit of color, uh, probably not a very good color, but some color. You'll probably find the diurnal, um, a, lot, a lot of the herbivores probably don't see as well in color as we do because they need to be able to see at night in case a lion wants to come and eat them. Uh, it doesn't have any benefit to them to be able to see color up here. Uh, much better for that they can pick up movement and a bit of detail. I think you'll find the primates see in color. Do they see as well as we do? Probably not in color. So I think it's a whole continuum, all right? We will eventually arrive at Biffles of Gam, which was the original plan for the afternoon. I could do with some Biffles of Dam water, Brian, if it was clean. Mm. You don't have any water with you, do you? I have a small sip. You Thank you so much. Just, uh, yes, right, right. Excuse me, everybody. My, I just need to wet my whistle. What do I do? Just suck. Right down a little bit. Deeply aged. Yes, I know. Yes, I'm talking to you. Mm, yes, absolutely. I think you offended me. I think I did. He was deeply offended by me. Did Louise say something to me? I'm not sure if I'm hearing her. Louise, please do a communications check. Oh dear. Ah, oh, there we go. We've got her. It's all okay. All right, enough of buffalo for today. Sorry to offend you, old fellow, but you just, you, I mean, you are quite old, really. Oh, Safari Dean, oh, here's an interesting thing. You are saying you'd like me to put my books on tape. Uh, well, I'm not sure I'll put them on tape, mainly because I don't know anybody who owns a cassette player anymore, Safari Dean. But in terms of audio books, absolutely. Um, during the next leave that I get, which will commence roughly on the 18th of March, I will be uh, doing just that. I'm going to spend four days doing it and sending it through to a company in Cape Town that looks after that sort of thing, and they'll edit it all together. And then you will be able to... <laughs> my voice recorded. <laughs> so thank you, Safari Dean, yes. If you really want a cassette tape made of them, maybe a series of cassettes, I will find someone to do that for you and send them to you. But given the fact, Safari Dean, that you're able to, you're sufficiently technologically advanced to uh, be watching uh, this live stream, I think you'll probably handle a digital probably find a digital uh, a digital medium through which to listen to my voice. Louise, you're going to have to go again with that, I'm afraid. A large gust of wind has taken my ears. Right. There are some zebra. Zebra in English. Ah, oh, perfectly poised, Brian. Mm. Pity about that leaf in the way, isn't it? Oh, shot's ruined. Shot is absolutely ruined. Can hardly tell what they are. Now, very interesting question, of course, about the colour. And Laura, you were chatting about the colour. And, I mean, to me, that white and black looks completely obvious through here. I mean, it's the most clear looking animal out here until, watch now, watch when this zebra moves into the thicket. That means zebra that you have to actually move into the thicket. There we go. Now, as they move, watch the stripes as they move. You see how they kind of play tricks with your eyes. Now a zebra that is running through bush like this and being chased by an animal that sees good contrast, but poor detail, and also in blues and greens, he's going to struggle to pick that up and struggle to pick up exactly which way it's running, and it's going to struggle to pick up one individual from the other. 
And I think that is by far the best theory for why they are striped. And there are all sorts of crackpot theories for, for why they do have stripes. Some of them going around thermoregulation, others around imprinting, you know, babies having to imprint on their mothers. I mean, the energy expenditure for a stripy pattern like that, just so that your baby can recognize you, when Impala, for example, look identical and their mothers have no problem, or their lambs have no problem identifying their mothers. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. Right, good, very nice. Now, I believe there are a few of these favorite words coming through. I'm looking forward to these. Uh, we're going to just park ourselves on the Bifflesbrook Dam wall. Uh, Brian will show us the beauty of the setting sun, and we'll go through a couple of those words. luck there will be a giant herd of elephants having a drink. <laughs> Bethany, apparently you say your f I think is a wonderful word. I love this word too. You say your favorite bush word out here is zizifus. Zizifus, I think Zizifus is a great word, and I think many of you said that you thought Zizifus was a good word. Nigel, I think you said tranquil. Very nice, also very nice. And then Susie, you said Lalapansi. Now, Lalapansi is the Zulu word for sleep, or go to sleep, lie down, sleep down. Ooh, we have action, everybody. Two saddle-billed storks winking, hunting at the waterhole. You just ease my way onto the damn wall here. It'd be very nice and Bula would just show his face here. It'd be marked. words coming through. Hit me again, Louise. Ah, Lenny, wonderful word, crepuscular. Isn't it wonderful? Debbie, petrichor, brilliant. And <laughs> Ig in Pretoria says, baobab is a lekker bush word. It is indeed, as is the word lekker, which means, uh, well, basically, I mean, Ig, you can, can, you can, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong here, but it's the Afrikaans word for to describe nice, anything nice. Lekker kos, nice food. Lekker uh, bosveld, nice bush, a beautiful bush. Uh, Chris Rowe, you say shoo. Sharon, <laughs> I like shoo as well. Sharon, you say Serengeti. I think it's a beautiful word, Serengeti. Just conjures up all sorts of images, doesn't it? Car and the Zimbo. Car and I've missed your word. You're in London. You're a Zimbabwean in London, and your word is mushy. I'm not sure what that means, but other than trying to make a, a, a husky run. Or mushy. Ah, yes, maybe mushy. Thank you for that, Car. Perhaps mushy. Ah. So these are saddle-billed storks, endangered species. I was hoping to see one of these on the school drive. Naturally, they flew off before we came live. And Safari Dean, your favorite word is Sibambili. If you could find out what Sibambili works for a means for a Safari Dean, that would be great. Now look, I was just reading about storks and their feeding. Uh, I've been terrorizing everybody at the lunch table for the last few days, reading a book called Ornithology for Africa. And reading about the feeding, different sort of feeding mechanisms that birds have. Now watch these storks. See how basically they are almost attempting to disturb the fish, and then they will peck down and some birds will impale fish, so uh, there's that word again, will actually drive, sort of harpoon them, drive their beaks through the fish's side, through the fish's flesh, 
and then pull them out again. Others, like these, are actually able to feel the fish. So they will, well, they'll feel them with their feet, and then they have an incredibly fast reaction speed where they'll feel, feel the fish move with the foot and stab down much harder than you and I could ever hope to reach our hands down. And they actually open their beaks quickly and grab the fish that they eat. So they wait until a fish touches the foot and then they'll stab down. So that's not done with eyes. Rusty Pipes, I think you're asking this on behalf of Scott Dyson. How do you say, can you believe it uh, in uh, Swahili? I don't know, Rusty Pipes. I'm no idea how to speak any form of Swahili. And you can see some movement in the water there. There'll be terrapins and there will be the odd catfish, I imagine, just coming out of the mud. Right, Brian, a quick look at the sunset, perhaps, before we press on to find the great number of leopards that we're hoping to see during the course of the afternoon. Uh, Nikki and Scott are out, actually, at the moment, trying to track. So were there to be a leopard, we would know. Ah, yes, Penny Pine. Uh, as we watch the sun go down, your favourite word, sundowner, and all that it implies. Sundowner, no downer, Brian. <laughs> Carol in Nebraska, of course, you've come up with the ultimate safari word, favorite word, that being the word Hendry, which is, of course, synonymous, you say, very kindly, with a good time. Um, well, I'm glad you think that, Carol. I'm very grateful for the fact that you think that. A little breeze coming up out of the southeast now. We're going to move down into this dip here. Let's see if we can find something of interest. I'm still waiting for Mvula to pop out here at some stage. There's a grey go-away bird there, and he's been sitting in this tree for the last little few days. And, of course, while we're sitting there watching the beautiful grey go-away bird, um, Brian, do you think it looks like anyone in particular? Mm, yeah, maybe. Who, Brian? Do you think somebody whose birthday it might be today? Potentially. Wh who? Mm, maybe Stefan Winterbur. It looks a little bit like Stefan Winterbur, doesn't it? Um, Steph and Jamie also. It's definitely not good looking enough to be Jamie. But uh, Jamie and Steph share a birthday today. Jamie, of course, is now, oh, well, I'm not allowed to tell you how old she is, of course. That would be rude. Stefan is, uh, well, he's reached the same age as I am now. We don't mention either. Now, that very spectacular little bird, very clever bird, is eating the buds of that acacia tree. So where the giraffe and elephant have taken the leaves off, so those leaves have tried to recover and they've put out buds. And very nutritious they are for the grey go-away bird, which you can hear saying, when it was compared to Stefan de Boer. Steph, of course, does not have hair like that anymore. He and I both suffer from, um, well, you know, we suffer from general hair loss. It's a sad state of affairs. Brian, you don't have the same problem, do you? No, yeah. not currently. Brian, of course, has the hair of the Birmingham boys. Long locks. There we go. And Chris Rogue, you say the loggerhead bird or butcher bird in the United States also is a, uh, well, very like the shrike, will impale its prey on thorns and on fences. And that's not all you said, Chris Rogue. You said... Thank you.
this is for Louise's benefit. Chris Rogue, like I was saying, happy birthday to you, long time loyal viewer, and we appreciate your time and your questions. So happy birthday to you, I hope it's a good one, I hope you eat lots of cake and drink much champagne. There are some, the call of the red-billed buffalo weaver. But I don't want to see a red-billed buffalo weaver now. I want to see a lip. Mm. Uh, Ravi, this is a, an impossible question to answer. Um, you want to know how much of an animal's behavior is nature and how much of it is nurture, i.e. how much of it is encoded in the genetics of the animal and how much is learned. Um, it's almost impossible to put a sort of um, blanket this much. Uh, it's, yeah, in fact, it, I mean, it'll vary between orders, it'll vary between classes, it'll vary between species. Some of the birds, the examples you gave, for example, nest building and migration seem to be entirely encoded in the genetic makeup of an animal, which is astounding. I mean, it just is amazing to me that a cuckoo, which never meets its parents, cuckoo never meets its actual biological parents. Remember, it's raised, for example, a Levallian's cuckoo is raised by a flock of arrow-marked babblers, to which it bears no resemblance whatsoever. And then in its first year, sometimes the second year, the cuckoo will migrate overseas off it'll go. It's never met its parents. No one's told it where to go. Nobody has indicated uh, that it should go at all. And its babbler family will stay behind to overwinter at home and the cuckoo will disappear overseas. And it is utterly astounding to me that that is encoded in the genetic makeup. And likewise, that cuckoo then knows not to lay its eggs uh, or not to try and build a nest. It knows it must lay its eggs in the nest of another bird and it'll know exactly which bird to do that to. Now, that is, a, that is just a remarkable behavior. Um, but then there are learned behaviors. And this, I think mammals, you will find, have far more learned behaviors than do, say, the birds. I think a lot of birds will have almost entirely uh, instinctual behaviors. Which is, I mean, you could talk about this forever and ever. Um, I think the closer you get to a primate, the more the less instinctual our behavior becomes and the more teaching has to take place. The larger your brain, I think you'll find, the, the more learning can take place and therefore the more learning does actually take place. That's a lovely subject. The subject of nature versus nurture for me is one of my favorites. Simply because normally, I mean the most obvious kind of conclusion to the discussion is that most of our behavior is nature via nurture. Now, Cower and Zimbo in London, um, you say you saw grey go away birds eating a certain kind of berry, which, whose name I did not hear. Luisi, can you go with the berry's name again, please? Syringa berries. Syringa berries, of course, the syringa plant is a plant in and that was come from India, that lives in South Africa and obviously in Zimbabwe, probably lines the streets of Harare. And it has a delicious smelling blossom in the summer, t in the spring, and then it produces a foul berry that is toxic to a human being, certainly. But you say you've seen go away, gray go away birds eating them. I suspect it's just because they don't have a digestive system that is affected by whatever toxin it is. Remember, lots of animals will have different digestive systems, and you look at something like a porcupine or a black rhino, which can eat uh, tamburti. Tamburti, of course, is totally toxic to human beings. Uh, you can't even cook on the meat, at least on the wood, without causing death in a human being. But those animals can eat them. Brian, look at that beautiful picture I found you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I do what I can for you, Brian. This has to be silent for a few seconds, mainly so that my voice might recover.
Just listen to the wind. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Maybe try and focus on the screen or shut your eyes and just inhale deeply. And try and smell a little bit of this ancient land. Try and get some of the ancient, ancient dust of Africa into your nose. Let it infuse you with a piece of this wilderness. Which is, of course, why I live out here. important, I think, to do that at least once or twice a day. Certainly at the sunset and sunrise to sit and do a little breathe, a mini meditation, if you like, on the magnificence of the wild and just let it touch you wherever it is that the wilderness does touch you. everyone let's carry on along the road here and we'll keep looking at the sun as we go brilliant question Diane um, you say if animals are colorblind why on earth do he wear khaki clothing in the bush Diane there a number of reasons for that. Foremost amongst them, of course, is because it's fashionable. Same reason that anybody wears any kind of clothing. Now, Brian, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Have you got your socks with you? Um, I'm going to get on camera briefly. Brian is wearing a color that is very popular at lodges around here. Now, would you mind, Brian, walking just gently behind that pelter forum bush there, and I shall film you. I would do this, of course, but I am not wearing the same color as you. <laughs> now, I will be off comms, Luisi, so you'll have to get hold of me after this. Right, everybody. Brian will be relatively in focus. Not very, of course, but relatively. Right. Now, this is important. A highly important experiment we're doing here. And I will walk the same way. Right. Brian? All right. Right. Off you go, then. Right. There he goes. Now, there, <laughs> there is Brian. Uh, just, uh, you keep going. Yes. Very good. Now, what can you notice there? That's perfect. What do you notice, everyone? You notice the color of his shirt. Right, come back, Brian. Thank you very much. Here he comes. Look at his marvelous athlete. I mean, the man is like watching a Greek god run. Okay, now I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> what you will notice, I think, I won't talk to you now, you won't hear me. Hang on, can't hear you, hang on. You don't have to, I'll talk when I get back. No, shut up there, we can hear you now. Okay, uh, what you will notice is that I am more difficult to see than Brian was. Bennett, Bennett. <laughs> now. <laughs> This wonderful question about the colors. I need to just plug Luisi back in, otherwise I'd be in trouble. Okay, Luisi, I'm back. Um, <laughs> so, as you saw, Brian's color was much easier to see, I think, than this one. Okay? And that's because Brian's, and Brian's is a very common khaki color worn out here. Khaki is not actually the best color to wear out here. The best color to wear out here would be gray. Like an elephant, an elephant is almost invisible in the bush. And 
it really doesn't actually make a huge difference what you wear as long as your um, clothes don't reflect light. Brian's color does reflect light. But um, if you were to wear blue, a dull blue, it wouldn't reflect light. If you, in fact, pale blue is a very good color to wear out here. If you were to wear kind of a chestnut brown color like an Impala, um, also if it didn't reflect light, that would be fine. You could wear a kind of a, a dull yellowish mustard color if you wanted to. You could definitely wear green if you wanted to. But if you were to wear something that reflected a lot of light, then animals would be able to see it more. I still don't believe, however, that animals will react that adversely. If you go on a walk, however, and you're going to approach big game on foot, it's best to have a neutral color that doesn't reflect light. So the fact that everybody is wearing khaki when they're on safari, you see these, I mean, I used to really have to bite my tongue when people used to arrive at the lodge, the entire families dressed in matching khaki clothing. Um, but I mean, they stuck out like sore thumbs because it was made of that kind of, um, that sort of semi-waterproof, sweaty material that, that uh, you know, allows you breathable material. But I mean, it shines like a beacon if you stand in the sun. And so this whole thing about khaki clothing is largely just for the fashion industry, to be honest. So I hope that answers the question, especially with our little experiment. Well done, Brian. Ah, actually, you're asking about the road system, and you say it looks like it's um. You say it's like it looks like it's in grids, basically. Uh, if you look at it from the air, if you watch it from the drone, obviously you've been watching some of Andrew's drone footage. Um, let's just quickly look at this waterbuck over here. Only because this is the only antelope we can find. Hello, waterbuck. How are you? Don't run away. <laughs> a little close uh, along the road. Oh, Brian, look at them. There's a whole plethora of them there, too. Um, the roads are straight like that, Ashley, because of the cut lines. So the cut lines are the boundaries between the farms, and so those are those straight roads that you can see uh, that look like they're parallel with each other. Then the loopy roads in the middle of the reserve are decided by the landowners. So they'll put them wherever they think the roads are going to get, take them through the best game viewing areas. Often they were placed many, many years ago when we didn't know nearly as much about kind of the correct place to put roads in order for them to reduce erosion. Um, but it is up to each private landowner. The Kruger would be a lot more careful about it. They have obviously got the means to close down and open new roads. Does that answer your question, Ashley? Look at those little heart-shaped noses. I've never seen so many water buck as I have on this reserve, and it's not because there's that much water. I can't really explain it, to be honest. Ah, now Shaz, you're in Memphis and you are worried about natural redheads and how they would be seen in the bush. Well, there's actually quite a really good answer for that. I mean, I was thinking about making some sort of prestigious comment about redheads, uh, but um, <laughs> I'm not going to. Shaz, uh, redheads, of course, are exactly the same color as female Nyala, basically. Uh, well, depending on your shade of red. Like you could be deep larange all the way down to a fairly dull auburn. But either way, remember how many animals out here are exactly that color. The impala, the nyala, um, what else would be that kind of orangey color? Impala and Yara are the most obvious ones. I mean, you could go as far as a, as a kudu, I suppose, if you were just slightly red. But those colors are brilliant out here because they are, well, they're brilliant because the, they're red, and if you 
are a predator like a lion or a leopard, you don't see red. It's almost impossible to see red. You see those blues and greens, and the red is not obvious at all. So it's actually a really good color to have red hair out here in the bush. That said, I was at school with a fellow who had red hair so red, I think he's currently being used as a lighthouse somewhere in the Cape. flip-flops and has long hair and maybe that's why he was easier to spot no no Teresa that is definitely not the case but it is possible that he was easier to spot because he's twice the size that I am but I don't think so I think it was the ex it was the uh, brilliant experiment we set up rather don't you think Brian yeah. yes but Brian is a, I mean Brian in a crowd is certainly more obvious than I am yes and thank you Louise Brian apparently is like a kudu and I am like a Stienbock. Thank you, Louise. That is uh, very kind of you. Mm. Well, we know which side of the toast you are buttering now. It's starting to get a little darker. We'll put on some lights, just in case a great herd of leopards should chance upon the road. Wouldn't want to miss them. Now, that is interesting. I don't know what's done that. I don't think that's an elephant. See how low down it is? You see how the bark has been stripped off that knob thorn tree, everyone? That is very common for an elephant, and in fact, that tree has been denuded a little higher up by elephants. But that low down, I wonder if a buffalo hasn't had a go at it. Rubbed his horns against it, maybe. Just so much that it's eventually rubbed the bark off. You see the tannin, you can see that red tannin there. Hmm. That's quite unusual. I can smell a waterbuck. Waterbuck smell like sort of musky horses. It's a lovely, comforting smell. Just blowing in on this rather delicious southeasterly breeze. On we go, Brian. baby nest that Scott had yesterday. Uh, yes, I think we can probably do that if I can find it. I know it's on Zoe's road. I'm just not sure exactly where. I'll try and get hold of Scott and find out from him. We know of three bush baby nests on the reserve, but we can definitely try and find the one that Scott went past. We're at the other end of the reserve at this stage, but we'll go around that way. Good suggestion. Thank you, Wendy. In uh, Snowy Fishers, Indiana, is that what it's called? There's a place called Snowy Fishers. Ah, it is, it is snowy in a place called Fishers, which is in Indiana. Thank you very much. Wendy, I hope it warms up a little for you there. The weather today was just positively marvelous here. It wasn't too hot, was it, Brian? No. Unlike the cooking of the midsummer. Let us head down this road into the setting sun, the last embers of the day. Janet, has this summer been hotter than normal? Janet, this summer has been the hottest summer on record. Since records started being kept in 1904, this is the hottest summer since then. And worldwide, as uh, Brother Leo told us as he claimed his Oscar, how true this is, I'm not sure. Apparently, this year was the hottest year on record in the world ever. So, I'm not really that surprised that we're having a big drought. It regularly hit above 40 degrees here, which is sort of 102, 103. 
and that would be relatively okay if we'd had any rain, but of course we haven't. Line, does it see, I think you're basically asking, does it see colors in a different way or do are things just invisible? Um, what I think you'll find, if I can use the redhead example again, because I think you used the redhead example, uh, blue and green, so they're seeing in blue and green, which means that red is difficult to see. That means that they will see red as a shade of blue or green. So it won't be invisible, but they will see it as a shade of blue or green. Now, if you are red and you are moving through a green environment or a blue-green environment, that color is going to be very difficult to see. Now, I mean, the best way to liken it is to if you saw in only black and white, right? You know that not everything is either black or white. If you see something, say, red in a black and white film, it's a shade of gray. And it'll be the same kind of variation. Somewhere between blue and gray, green will be red. And that's how it will work. I hope that kind of makes sense. So red head would not be completely invisible, no. It would be a shade of blue and green in much the same way that gray is a shade of black and white mixed together on a black and white film or photograph. Why can I not find any leopards anymore? Do you think they have left, or do you think I'm just incompetent? Be careful how you answer, given that we're about to drive through a drainage line. Touch and go. Maybe, possibly. <laughs> Potentially, maybe. Right, we will go to that bush baby nest now. Now, Louise thinks she is deeply amusing this evening. She says, Steenbock don't find leopard, leopard finds Steenbock. Louise, dangerously close to a frog in your bed. Okay, we're going down through the Umrulwati drainage line now. Where we may lose signal. If we do, I'm sorry. I'm just going to try and get hold of Scott quickly and see if he is still mobile. And if he is, I just want to try and find where that bush baby nest is for Wendy. Scott Dyson, do you copy? Good evening, James. Good evening, Scott. Um, I am fine, thank you. I want to know, please, where that bush baby nest was on Zoe's Road. Wendy would like to know. there everybody he's going to tell us he's going to show us exactly what it is perfect Penny and 
Columbus, Indiana. Thank you for asking me a question to which I do not know the answer, um, or to which is not the answer is not immediately apparent. We're going to have to think about it together. Um, you say, are there any animals out here that are there any animals out here that imitate each other's behaviour? Um, I mean, they're the birds, of course. The birds imitate each other's calls, so I suppose that's a, a method of imitating behavior. But I don't know that there are any, say, mammals which would imitate another mammal's behavior. Monkeys, maybe. Monkeys might imitate other animals' behavior. Really? Yeah, I was on the road, you missed it. Slid it away. Is it gone? Yeah, it's gone. Oh, there was a snake, everyone. Which side did it go? A big one, Brian. A little snake. Just scuttled off in here. That is very poor of me that I didn't see that. Oh, alas and alas. Hmm. Sorry about that, everyone. It would have been a nice sighting. Monkeys will probably imitate others. Um, they probably imitate human behavior when they're about humans. I would think, if, again, the closer you get to a human being in an animal, like a chimpanzee, they will be able to imitate human behavior. Would an impala ever Im Tim, um, imitate a kudu? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's possible. Would a leopard ever imitate a lion? No, definitely not. Interesting one. Penny, I'd be very interested to know if you thought that I was wrong or if there were some other animals that maybe do imitate each other that you know of. Now, I'm going to keep my eyes to the front in case there's another snake. We know now where the bush baby nest is and we are on our way there. Wendy, do not go away. Do not leave your screen for one second. The scrub hair, we will have to come back to that scrub hair. Or possibly find another. Hello, happy cub. Apparently, um, Scott spotted a while back a genet moving some little babies, some kittens they're actually called, even though they're not very really related to cats, uh, out of a nest in a tree hole, and you want to know if anybody knows what's happened to them. No, no one knows what's happened to them. Happy cub, I'm afraid. We didn't see them again. Janice, you know, because we don't spend a huge amount of time out at night, and the equipment is not kind of designed for long sojourns of night driving, uh, we, I think we miss out on a few of the night species, so genets and civets and servals and perhaps African wildcat. And obviously we are working on that and attempting to do a lot more during the night. And I think w what we will find is that things like genets and civets and those amazing animals of the night, like Artfark even, I think we're going to spot a lot more of them when we spend a bit more t time out at night. I don't know if you heard as we went past that. I don't want to stop. I just want to try and get to this nest quickly. Um, I don't know if you heard there's some cicadas still calling. As we're going slightly into autumn now, but I think that little bit of rain we had has perhaps caused the last ditch attempt by the males to have a mating opportunity before the winter sets. <laughs> One minute, one minute. Down this road. Watch the Cashier Berkey eye. Down 
through the drench line. It really has been a perfectly temperatured day today. You say a stick insect imitates a stick. <laughs> yes, it does help. Thank you, Jen B. I think this is the tree here. Scott isn't here. I don't think I don't think he's actually able to be here. Is this the tree? He said just sort of eye level. I don't see a slit here though. It might be on this side of the tree though. Ask him once more. Scott, confirm in a knobthorn tree. I don't think so, James. I think it's a sort of cluster leaf. Small, probably 10 centimeters in diameter tree, and at the first major fall, about a meter and a half off the ground, that's where the, the hole is. As far as close, I'd, I'd come and show you. Okay, copy, thanks. He's actually a bit far away. He said in a silver cluster leaf tree, that is unquestionably a knob thorn tree. And he said a meter and a half off the road. Kirsten says she thinks it might be this tree. Um, I'm, I tell you what, I'm going to get a little bit further up the road. It is this tree. She's not sure. Deeply unhelpful, Kirsten, thank you. A little bit further up. Oh, here's a big tree here. Here's a big tree here. I didn't say it was a big tree. This tree might be a bit large. This was also a knob form. What we'll do is, I think he was coming down the other way when he saw it. So we'll just go a little bit further up, look at a few more, and then turn around and come back down. I think that'll give us a better idea. would be nice around now. Yes, I agree. I think anything would be nice around about now. Don't you, Brian? Mm. Just some kind of heartbeat, even if it was reptilian. Like a snake. Okay, I'm going to just go find a turnaround spot and we'll come back down. Here's a very small cluster leaf. Kirsten? Does it look like this tree? Kirsten. I think we've definitely gone too far now. I'm going to turn around here. I'm sorry about this, Wendy. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. I'm sorry. Oh, Scott, once more. Scotty, confirm only about five meters north of the dip. Yeah, five or ten meters. Um, as you go through it, uh, yeah, five or ten meters right on the edge of the road. Certainly, it's a classic. It may have been a bushwhacker. Okay, copy, thanks. He says definitely only five or ten meters after the dip on this side of the road. Okay. One more pass by, everyone. Let's see. Here it is. I don't think it can be anything other than this. What do you think, Brian? Kirsten, does this look like it? 
This is it. Okay. There you are, Wendy. Unfortunately, no bush babies in it at this stage. And it's hard to believe that a little bush baby could get into that. But what I suspect is, you see, oh, Brian go to the top of the tree there. I suspect quite strongly there's an entrance there that they go into, and this is probably just a little window. Cool. Well, there they are. Um, <laughs> at the moment, it's just a hole in a tree. That's a pity. It will. Can't win them all, Brian. Sometimes you don't win any. Mm. Mm. Right, there we go. I'm afraid, Wendy, that is the best I can do on the bush baby front at this stage. We will try and find you another bush baby, Wendy. Fear not, fear not. Be brave and full of light. Come on, Brian, let's find a bush baby. All right, right. All right. Yeah. Here we go. For those of you who don't know, Bush Baby, a little primate that looks a bit like a lemur. Or Gizmo from Gremlins. And you want a Bush Baby call from us. Bush Babies, unfortunately, the lesser Bush Baby that we get here doesn't make a sound. So, unfortunately, Brian and I can't help you there. They do make a very sort of high-pitched squeal but um, Brian and I, of course, being men, are unable to make that high-pitched squeal. The thick-tailed bush baby makes a horrific screaming sound. I'm definitely not going to attempt that. Uh, any young viewers that are watching will never sleep again if I make the sound of the thick-tailed bush baby. It is a blood-curdling scream. Louise, again, is being deeply amusing at the moment. She says uh, she swears our voices go higher, judging by the rat video that we posted. Now, there are two aspects to that comment. Uh, the first is that, uh, to tell you that we did post a video of Andrew, Brian, and I <laughs> attempting to catch a rat in Brian and Andrew's home. Now, the rat escaped. And the rat escaped because the three grown men trying to catch it were terrified, basically. And we made a loud squealing noise. Um, but we couldn't really do that squealing noise again, Louise, because there is no rat to terrify us. Were there to be a rat? Yes, I agree. We would be able to make a loud squealing sound that would be similar to that of a bush baby. Just keep an eye out in the trees here. The trees will be shining, or the eyes of the bush babies will be shining, if there are any around. Big bumps coming up. Now, Jeffrey, I don't know if you're still watching us in Texas. We're just coming past your favorite tree, the sausage tree. There it is. And the sausage tree, I was just confirming today, and is a tree that produces beautiful red flowers and principally fed upon and pollinated by orioles. There are no flowers in that tree this year. I suspect because of the drought. But there are also no orioles in that tree at this stage, obviously. Astounding. My luck over the last little while. Anyway, it will return one day, don't you think, Brian? Mm. I've done something wrong. And karma is uh, not treating me with due respect. A bit of weather blowing in. It's quite a hot day. I don't think there's going to be a storm at all. Very nice to have a storm. <laughs> We're 
waiting now after quarantine clearings, hoping there'll be something up there. And if there isn't, we'll do one last pass past the Juma Dam and see if there isn't something coming to drink under the cover of darkness. Now, I think we can't see the Juma Dam cam feed, but I think that you can if you go to the website. So if there is anything there, don't forget to tell me, please. flying about the place. There they go. Can you track a moth with a camera, Brian? Uh, no. No. Now that's interesting. So Penny Pine, wonderful story. Thank you for that. There are a whole lot of impalas there which we're not going to shine on. Penny Pine, you say you had a juvenile bush, thick-tailed bush baby calling and it had been abandoned or something like that, and it attracted the attention of hyenas and the leopard. So that is the kind of dreadful, distressing squealing that a thick-tailed bush baby makes. There are impala all over this clearing. Now we know, of course, that they come out into the clearings because they want to see anything that might want to eat them, and their color, sort of chestnutty brown. Very good if you want to be hiding from a completely nocturnal animal that sees only in blues and greens. So I think these guys will be pretty much colorblind as well, mainly because there's no advantage to them seeing color during the day. Huge advantage to them not seeing color. Walter R. Buck, you want to know if we see any six-toed cats? Molydactyl, I think it was called. Um, we don't, Walter. Polydactyl. We don't see polydactyl cats out here. And I've, I was asked a question about this a while back, and I suggested that a polydactyl cat would be the result of inbreeding. This resulted in a slightly... Um, heated exchange, if you like, because I know that there are a couple of domestic cat breeds that do have polydactyl, or exhibit polydactylitiness, whatever the word is. And I'm afraid, I suspect that's because of, obviously, many of our domestic breeds of animals have got a very narrow genetic pool. And so I, it wouldn't surprise me to know that domestic cats were polydactylous, but I think it's highly unlikely that you'd find a wild cat that was polydactyl. Thank you for that. It seemed to be a great hive of activity here at the Juma Pan. It's just amazing how that little bit of rain that we had completely dissipated all of the rain. At least completely dissip dissipated the animals from this area because they could go off and drink at the pans and the natural collection points of water all over the place. It really does astound me how little it took. Because, of course, during the height of the drought, and I'm sure it will happen again during the winter and during the dry season that we're heading towards, this will be a hive of marvelous, interesting activity and conflict for water. Now, Karen, you want to know if we're going to have a fireside chat, and you're in Oregon. Uh, we are going to have a fireside chat, Karen. I'm going to stop here just for the last minute. And Karen, our fireside chat, of course, will focus largely on the highlights of Scott Dyson's rather illustrious career in this area. Uh, a guest appearance will be made with any luck by Nicola Austin. Uh, that will be a treat for all concerned. Um, and that will be on Saturday because they leave on Sunday morning. So, excuse me. <laughs> it, it will be on Saturday that we have the fireside chat. And we'll show highlights of Scott's kind of career here. We're hopefully going to try and find his first drive, which I think will be thoroughly amusing, especially when you see the highly accomplished presenter that he has become. Certainly, I have learned an enormous amount from him. 
that's it from us tonight. Thank you, Brian. You've seen us for three hours. Well done, Brian. Well done, Thumb. Well done, Louise and Kirsty in the final control. And well done, well, nobody else to say well done to other than to you. And thank you for keeping us going for three hours. It was a wonderful conversation that we have. We will see you tomorrow at 05.30 when the dawn breaks here in the magnificent wilderness that is the Kruger National Park. Until then, bye-bye.